Uh, we are live, sir. Good morning, sir. We are live, sir. We can start, sir. अजित कुमार एम एन चेयरमैन ट्रेवलर committee of indian orthopedic association welcoming all of you to the first webinar in our series conducting along with the association of pelvic stabilizer surgeons india as all of us know pelvic fracture especially unstable types have a high rate of late problems pelvic ring injuries can jeopardize not only the function but the very life of the patient using standard indications and techniques a good anatomical reconstruction can be achieved even in unstable injuries so the theme for today's webinar is what every orthoped must know about the pelvic fractures our objectives for all these webinars are to increase the awareness about the successful outcomes of properly done pelvic stabilizer trauma surgery to teach life saving techniques for displaced pelvic fractures to highlight the right indication and monitoring of conservative treatment for pelvic stabilizer trauma to import knowledge by algorithm based assessment and classification of pelvic stabilizer fractures to suggest proper systematic approach to plan surgical approach steps and implants for pelvic stabilizer fractures so in today's webinar we will be covering nine topics about pelvic fractures by eminent faculties from all over india now i invite dr b shivashankar sir president indian orthopedic association for the welcome address good morning everybody i welcome all the faculty and all the people who are watching this webinar live for this today's first webinar by the pelvic stabilizer subcommittee of ioa dr ajit kumar has done a wonderful job along with the other subcommittee members as well as the president and secretary of the association of pelvic stabilizer surgery aopas i thank them for their active involvement and uh, participation i welcome all of you and i take this opportunity to wish our ioa secretary dr navin tucker who is also here today a happy birthday happy birthday navin and over to ajit kumar for further proceedings thank you dr navin takkar sir few words you are on mute uh, navin nothing much sir thank you thank you dr sivashankar for best wishes today and uh, i i wish best for the uh, this academic activity by pelvic stabilizer surgeons of the india and it is a combined activity of indian orthopedic association and pelvic stabilizer association so uh, i i do not want to talk much because that will lessen our academic uh, uh, part of the time so i welcome all and thank you all for uh, active participation and spreading the knowledge thank you now i invite dr rajesh rajput is a president association of pelvic stabilizer surgeons of india yeah thank you ajit uh, first of all i really want to thank uh, ioa for coming up with this brilliant idea of involving all the associations uh, which were working on a independent basis now they are uh, working together with ioa and we feel really proud of uh, joining ioa along uh, with this uh, other subcommittees so that's a wonderful idea so thank you dr shiv shankar thank you also the incoming president dr ramesh sen and also president elect uh, dr atul shivastav and uh, also i think i would especially want to thank uh, prana who has put up a wonderful uh, program and he's done all the hard work for it uh, also i think uh, we should thank our uh, whole audio visual teams here uh, ashok neeraj and uh, shamsul you know without their efforts uh, this wouldn't have been uh, fruitful and it's actually going down uh, in a lot of channels uh, so we were just discussing that uh, before the uh, meet itself uh, now i want to introduce the individual faculty members i think whatever little i say about dr ramesh sen um, will be you know just not enough 
how much ever I say. So I think uh, Dr. Ramesh is uh, currently working in uh, Max Mohari. Uh, again, about Vivek, I think uh, after Ramesh uh, uh, put India on the map, Vivek has been doing the globe trotting and uh, giving uh, Indian orthopedic surgeons a very good name uh, abroad. John, uh, again, the stalwart and the, uh, you know, so-called elephant from uh, Patna. The rest all just dwarf uh, out there. So John, again, welcome you. Srinivas uh, from Kims, um, again, uh, you know, very, very bright surgeon. Abhay from Jodhpur, uh, Ames, he's a professor there. And again, a very, very bright surgeon uh, who's making big marks. Uh, Ashok Gavaskar from Rela Institute. Um, Ashok has got interest both in trauma and uh, uh, reconstructions. Um, Ashok, uh, Raju, again from, uh, you know, Sunshine Hospital, Hyderabad. You know, if uh, there is a saying that orthopedic surgeons can be gentle, you just need to look at uh, Ashok Raju. Then Pradeep Nimare uh, from KEM Mumbai. Um, Tata Steel uh, used to sell their steel saying that we also make steel. And uh, Nimare uh, sells himself as he also does arthroplasty and, and uh, arthroscopy. So I think uh, uh, with this, uh, we'll move on to the talks today. So the first talk is by me itself. It's a very esoteric topic. Uh, I hope I'm done. So just let me know if I'm visible and audible. Yes, sir. Okay. So I think we'll discuss about the epidemiology impact both on patient and on society in general um, about the diagnosis on excess and also the outcomes of uh, this because that has a bearing about uh, whatever else we do with these fractures. Uh, so my learning objectives for today's talk would be increasing awareness about the pelvic injuries um, about the general outcomes uh, after a patient has sustained these fractures, uh, what is the impact on the patient and in turn the impact on society and introduction to the imaging in general. There'll be further uh, discussions on classifications and imaging uh, by other speakers later on. So the pelvic uh, fractures by itself comprise less than 3% of skeletal injuries, but they are a very important uh, subset of uh, skeletal trauma. The incidence is less than one per black population, but again, this is generally Western data. The majority of fractures are due to high velocity, but there are plenty of uh, fractures which happen with minimal trauma. Men are predominant uh, stakeholders in these fractures. Uh, again, this is a Western data, which is 56% uh, versus 48 in women. But if you look at the Indian data, and I will quote one paper very extensively, and probably the only epidemiological paper we have from India, where the data is quite skewed towards men. Again, the young patients are more the average patient age in India is around 37 years. So you can imagine this is the bread holder. This is a young, active male, a family person who is now getting injured. So 10% uh, of this will also have complications with other visceral injuries. Uh, so this is uh, something to think about. Mortality, again, is around 10%. Again, something to think about. So these are the uh, different studies which have been done, which I'm quoting at the moment. So majority of these are high injuries. We've, we've discussed that. Again, a paper telling you about the other likelihood of injuries. So anybody who wants to go through the epidemiology, these are the papers I think you might want to bank up on. I'll skip over from here now. Now, apart from the actual mortality itself, you got to highlight the subset of these pelvic fractures, which if they are open, your mortality rates are rising close to 45%, sometimes even 50%. So that's a huge, huge risk from being a closed fracture to becoming an open fracture. Again, if you are an elderly population, then your chances of mortality is 20%. So think if you are an elderly with open fracture, what chance really you have of survival? Now, what does, how does these fractures impact upon to the patient? And how does this injuries then, this patient impacts on the society? So regarding impact on the patient itself, you can have low impact injuries, high impact injuries. We know low impact injuries are two different age groups. One is the elderly, one is the younger population which generally is the athletic type of injuries. But the high impact injuries normally are due to road traffic or sometimes fall from very high. Now, what are the risk factors? Now, if you have sustained a pelvic fracture, what makes your outcome worse? Now, if you have low bone mass, if you are a smoker, very strangely, if you had a hysterectomy done, I think, which means that you can, your uh, you know, uh, visceral uh, damage will be a bit more. And if you're an older age, which probably is due to low bone mass and some other comorbidities, and if you have propensity to fall, like poor hearing or poor eyesight or uh, balance problems, this may lead, you have a very high risk of injuries. And age 60 is a very significant predictor 
of uh, also you know uh, bleeding so this is a paper which i'll be quoting quite which is the samir uh, agarwal uh, paper though i think uh, when uh, this paper uh, was analyzed this was 2015 2016 over a 16 month period i think dr sain was also there at that time so uh, uh, if you look at this paper extensively you will probably see that in this paper 75% people were actually males and if you look at the age group they were you know uh, majority of the fractures here were the lateral compression types now if you look at the uh, age groups many of these patients were uh, younger around 37 and if you look at the uh, stay in the hospital it was 14 days so these people do stay in hospital for long and occasionally a patient may even stay a month or a month and a half you can go up to so this will have an implication on finances of these patients if they are getting treated outside the government setup or even sometimes in the government setup so once you have sustained the injury you've been diagnosed you've been treated or you've been treated conservatively and not by operatively what are the general outcomes of these patients and one thing we want to understand is that these are associated with very high morbidity and mortality so if it is associated with high mortality what is it exactly which is killing these patients so one third of these patients will die from hemorrhage and we know that you can have bleeding from either arteries or veins 20% of this bleeding will come from either arteries and about 80% of this will come from the venous plexus which are around the sacrum and hence if you want to save these patients and improve the outcome one major goal or main major aim out towards our directing our treatment should be to control this bleeding and that way your outcome will get better what are the other things which are going to cause trouble to us one will be the urological problems and these are not very small issues if you look at uh, these patients and analyze them later on particularly the one displaced fractures you are looking at 10 to 12% urethral injuries uh, in males and about 6% in females female urethra being only about 4 cm actually protects them from having too many injuries but still they do get it and also once they have recovered prolonged and painful micturition remains a very common problem and if you ask them very carefully they don't volunteer this information but if you ask them many of them will admit to having these fractures and the most severe fractures you have the most severe these complications are if you are a male then it's just not having problem with micturition even your sexual remember these patients are young so this activity is not a totally past time for them it's a very important time many of them may be having families so not having a uh, good sexual life will be very disabling for them apart from having all the major time which they have spent in hospital now having super added these problems will create lot of psycho psychological issues with these patients and it is quite frequently seen in this population now if you are a lady you may also have trouble with you know uh, you may have dyspareunia or uh, childbirth problems if you have displaced fractures but luckily if you have treated them surgically and fixed them well the incidence of having a good delivery whether it's a cesarean section or a vaginal delivery is actually good and not having too many difficulties the other big issues these patients regarding outcomes will be the neurological issues so many of these patients will have neurological issues and particularly the vertical displacement fractures or the tile c as we call them will have these issues but if you analyze them over a one year period about 80% of them will get better so you may have still 18% one eight 18% of them still having some persistent motor deficit now our goal is ultimately to get these patients back to their work and also to their recreational lifestyle are we being very successful to them and here if you look at these studies you will probably see that 60% of the surgical treated patients do get back to their work and about 16% will remain uh, you know were able to switch job and remain employed but quite a few of them will not be able to get back to work at all now being a young patient being the active member of this family will have huge repercussions on you know the society in general because of these patients not being able to uh, get back to work and the, one of the principal reasons why they don't get back to work is pain and the worse the fracture was the more likelihood that they will be red they'll be uh, left with some amount of pain now let's come to the x-ray how do we diagnose with x-rays so one of the pearls i can give you is that your x-rays are not directed just at looking at the fracture itself you should also think what these fractures are doing so if this fracture is going to cause internal injuries maybe a ultrasound or a fast scan might be a good thing to go in the beginning itself think about when they are lying in bed they might be so be having dvts some of them may have pe so you need to get uh, investigations done for them so all different sorts of uh, investigations may be required including an angiography if you are thinking bleeding is still going on so we'll actually concentrate on x-rays here 
So the standard X-rays for pelvic acetabular injury is what we advise is an AP pelvis, which is also your screening X-ray for uh, a major trauma. But in here, we'll have additional inlet outlet and Jude views. Let's see how do we go about this and what we are actually seeing. So from the first trauma series, you will probably get an AP X-ray. So what you're looking at here is the rings, which you see here, we'll come back to those rings. You look at the joint spaces, we'll come back to that. You look at the acetabulum, you look at the sacral foramina, and you will also look at the other injuries nearby what you see, which is the proximal femur. So how do we start reading these X-rays? And the first thing you start looking at is from the anterior aspect from the symphysis pubis itself. So look at if there is a symphysis pubis disruption or a symphysial fractures. Then you move on on the superior pubic rami, go along the iliopectineal line, go all the way back to the uh, sacrum and see if there's any disruption at the sacro uh, iliac joint. Then you look at the sacrum, are there any fractures which you can see on the sacrum? And the same uh, arc, you continue on the other side and come back to where you started. Once you've done that, you may again look for additional things like you know, sacro tuberous or sacro spinous avulsions. And then look also uh, you know, for the foramina, uh, the operator foramina. So what are the rings we are going to look at? One is the pelvic inlet ring. We are going to look at and actually trace all around uh, very, very consciously to see if there's any break or discontinuity or deformity in this ring. So the deformity just could be because of the positioning of these patients. Many of them are not able to lie properly on the, uh, the X-ray table. So we got to be sure that the X-ray is done properly. So we also look at the operator foramen and we see whether they are matched together. And if not, what is the reason for that? So you may have a complete uh, operator ring or you may have an incomplete, which means that it's broken by bone fragments or by the fracture itself. Then we look at the SI joint. And the standard uh, descriptions we give is if it's, you know, we are talking about normal excess, which is like full size digital. So if it's less than four mm, uh, we probably feel that the SI joint is okay. Similarly, at the symphysis, if it's less than five mm, it's okay. And if you have got the other side, which is normal, it's easier to compare if the other side uh, is normal. Then the widening on the other side is a bit easy to interpret. Now, when you see these excess, here, though we the subject today is the pelvic fractures, we cannot you know, just assume that there is nothing happening on the estabular side. So we've got to look at that also. And the lines which we draw for the, uh, the picking up mainly for the estabular fractures will be the iliopectineal line, which is the red line, which you see on your screen, the ischial line, which is the blue line, which you see on screen, and also the teardrop, which will give you an idea uh, about the uh, fractures on the quadrilateral plate. Also, you look at the roof, which is a green line, and also, you look at the black and the brown line, which are the anterior and the posterior wall. Now, many of us find difficulty to trace the posterior and the anterior wall. So, one uh, guideline which uh, we can suggest to you is that if you trace the operator foramen, where you just see the blue line going up at the apex of this operator foramen, from there, if you draw a line to the outer lip of the estabulum, that would be your anterior estabular wall. Now, if you trace the ischial tuberosity all the way up, where you can see the femoral head coming in from there, if you draw the line all the way to the, the outer lip of the estabulum, that would be where your posterior ball of the estabulum is. So that's on the AP axis, you can get all this information and you can then start interpreting whether you have a break in the iliopectin line, you have a break in the iliosquial line, or you have a break on the wall itself of the uh, estabulum. So again, uh, recapitulating, you're going to look at the, uh, the inlet, you're going to look at the symphysis, operator foramen, the SI joint, and also on the sacral foramina. So these are one of the important aspects we actually look at. And then again, you add certain other views because you just can't assume this is only a uh, pelvic fracture. You would put some obliques, uh, internal oblique and external oblique. So this is an internal oblique view where you see the whole uh, operator foramen properly. You also see the posterior wall in more profile and you see the uh, anterior column. Similarly, if you uh, uh, do an ex uh, external oblique view, you see the posterior column very well, you see the anterior wall very well, and you see the whole ileum in profile and you can pick up fractures on the ileum very, very, very easily. The main views which we want for pelvic fractures is an actually inlet and outlet view, but also we want to be sure that they've been done properly. So you need to angle your beams minimum 40 degrees to get these views properly. And how do you know that it's been done properly? So if you look at the inlet view, which is the picture uh, on top of your screens, so there the sacral promontory should actually be coming in front of the whole sacrum. So you should almost be not be able to see the sacrum itself. You know, you've got a very good inlet view. So how do you know you've got a very uh, good uh, outlet view? So if you look at the top of symphysis here, it should be overlapping on almost like an S2 segment. So if you overlap on S2 segment, you know you've got 
a good outlet for you. So, you know, in trauma scenarios, we don't want to be uh, so dedicated, but if you tease this to your uh, radio, uh, radiographers, they will actually give you good views and they'll just do it first time, right? So, and this views when you do, this will help you in classifying. I'm not going to go details into classification, that is John's talk. So, but it'll give you an idea whether you have injury from the sides, from the front, or you've gone upwards. Similarly, you can actually look at the other classification, whether you're stable or unstable. Okay. So I again want to come back to and highlight this point that if you look at the percentage of associated injuries in a pelvic fracture, it actually will frighten you. And it's amazing that how many of them we miss, but still does not have a consequence on the outcome of these patients. But if you see the chart here, the percentage wise, it's very seldom that a patient gets away with a very displaced fracture and not having these associated injuries. Many of them are healing by itself and hence it's not showing up to us. But if you go and go looking deep into it, you will come across a lot many of them actually being injured. So in summary, I think I would like to stress that these injuries are life-threatening and hence you want to get them right first time. So even when you work in a very you know, far off places, there are enough uh, surgeons now, particularly uh, very good work done by the AO pass uh, in the past. And we have created a lot of surgeons all over the country, uh, you know, who are ready to give you a helping hand. So if you're a beginner, I won't say that don't tackle them, but tackle them having one uh, expert surgeon uh, with you. That way you'll be doing justice to the patient. And also I think you will feel a lot better uh, once you have the good outcome in these patients, because the poor outcome is not treated and uh, uh, you'll have a poor outcome if you don't treat them adequately. And this will have an impact on the patient. And remember, this is a young, working, probably a labor class patient, quite a few of them. And this will have a huge replication on the society. So we want to get them right and get them right first time. I think I would like to stop uh, my talk here now. I'm happy to have any questions, though this was a very esoteric topic. I doubt if there are any questions. We we can move on to the next talk. Next talk. No okay. So I'll share my screen. Yeah, so is that, John, yours classification? Yeah, I think classification and CT scans. So yeah. um, it's interesting when, when the first topic was given uh, initially to me, it just meant, mentioned young Burgess. So I'm going to concentrate on that and just say a little bit about the other classifications. Uh, I think the learning outcomes would be to Hopefully at the end, you can classify pelvic fractures, understand how it helps in understanding and management, and talk a little bit about the role of CT scans. So it's interesting that your first X-ray uh, investigation when you see these pelvic injury patients is a single AP X-ray. And you actually uh, miss only 9% of any significant injuries with just the AP injuries. And it does not change your acute management in terms of uh, requiring CT scans, etc. So your initial x-ray when the patient comes in, in the emergency department is just an AP x-ray. You don't need to do the other x-rays and CT scans, which were discussed earlier, till you have stabilized the patient hemodynamically. Now, it's interesting thing about the classification is that it should aid in predicting your the hemodynamic instability, in predicting visceral and gastrourinary injuries, uh, it should aid in predicting pelvic instability and understanding the mechanism of injury and the force vectors of injury and eventually should help you in planning your surgical tactics for reduction of the fracture and fixation. Now, the classifications uh, were many, starting with the anatomical classifications initially and then uh, the more uh, recent uh, or more commonly used classification, which is probably the most commonly used classification, is that of the young Burgess, young and Burgess. Uh, you have a classification based on stability by tile, and then you have the AO OTA comprehensive classification. Now the young Burgess classification looks at the mechanism of injury. So you can start with a lateral compression injury, which means the forces from one side of the pelvis, which causes an implosion of the pelvic ring. You have the external rotation injury, which is usually an antero posterior injury, which causes opening out of the pelvis, which is uh, the so-called AP compression injury. Then you have the vertical shear injury, which tends to vertically displace one side of the pelvis. And then you have combined mechanism where you can't really tell a particular mechanism of injury, which is the cause of the fracture or the injury. 
The other thing to understand in any of this, uh, in the young budget classification is, uh, or any classification, is actually the ligamentous structures in the pelvis, which are the most important. So we are looking at the bones, but we are really looking uh, for the disruption to the ligaments. Now, when you come to the lateral compression fracture, where the fracture is from the lateral side, usually the anterior fracture of the pubic ramus is a transverse type of fracture. You can occasionally get a locked uh, symphysis, okay? Uh, but if you look at the posterior fracture in the uh, LC1 type of injury, it's usually a compression fracture of the anterior sacrum and usually means that the force is directed a little more posteriorly. When you come to the LC2 type of injury, you still have the anterior injury, but the posterior injury is usually an iliac wing fracture of an crescent fracture involving the SI joint. While the LC3 injury, you have a compression fracture on one side, but you also have a contralateral SI injury. So while you have a lateral compression type of injury on one side, the, the injury on the other side tends to be more like a anterior posterior compression injury. Coming to the anterior posterior compression injuries, you have the APC1, 2, and 3. Now, APC1 was initially dis, uh, mentioned that the opening of the uh, symphysis was less than 2.5. Uh, APC2 was more than 2.5, and APC3, where the posterior secure iliac ligaments were disrupted. Again, uh, APC1 uh, implies that it's only the symphysial ligaments that are disrupted. APC2 then signifies that the pelvic floor ligaments, as well as the anterior part of the posterior sacroiliac ligaments are involved, while the APC3 means the entire posterior, uh, posterior sacroiliac ligament complex is disrupted. So it makes this fracture more unstable. And the vertical shear, of course, are unstable injuries where uh, one part of the pelvis is uh, sort of displaced vertically while you have the combined mechanisms where you can, have, which the most common mechanism is a combination of the lateral compression and a vertical shear injury. So diagrammatically, you will come to this picture as was mentioned. So the LC1 with the anterior sacral fracture, LC2 with a iliac wing or a crescent fracture, and LC3 with a contralateral injury. Similarly, APC, you just have some opening of the anterior symphysis. So, uh, in APC2, you have a more widening of the symphysis and the floor ligaments are involved and the anterior part of the posterior sacroiliac ligaments are involved while in the APC3 uh, even the posterior part of the sacroiliac ligaments are involved and of course you have the vertical shear injuries. Now uh, so uh, example of it here's a lateral compression here you've got more like a lock, a lock symphysis rather than a pubic symphysis fracture and you can see the sacral fracture on the opposite side. There's an APC compression, you can see there's a cross widening of the uh, uh, symphysis pubis, but posteriorly it's more anterior opening of the SI joint. So, and there's no significant vertical displacement. While you have the vertical shear injury where you can see the entire hemi pelvis on the left side is shifted uh, superiorly. Now, in terms of uh, resuscitation, so in terms of Hemodynamic stability, if you look at the young purchase classification, is the LC3, the APC2 and 3, the vertical shear, and the combined mechanism of injuries, which are most uh, often would require resuscitation. They also have a higher chance of associated injuries, such as abdominal visceral injuries, head injuries, and vascular injuries. And vascular injuries are most common in the APC2 or 3 type of injuries. So I think so there's some correlation between the fracture pattern and the severity of injury and the requirement for resuscitation and also uh, visceral injuries and bleeding. Now, uh, more recently, uh, this is a paper in 2017, which talked about the WSES classification, which is the World Society for Emergency Surgery. And they felt that more than just the mechanism and the pattern of the fracture, it was the overall injury of the patient in terms of the severity. So they looked at the injury severity score as well to try and type, uh, figure out which patients needed emergency resuscitation. And so they divided them into three groups. They had grades, uh, which were four, which was WSES grade one, two, three, and four. And then uh, depending on the type of WSES grade, they were divided into minor, moderate, and severe. 
So minor were the WSES, a one type of injury, moderate included the two and three grade types of injury, and the severe was the grade four type of injury, which was the more dynamically uh, unstable patient. So when they looked at that, so the two and three came into this moderate category, and these were the ones you would go on to investigate further, do the CT scans, uh, and plan your eventual treatment, while the severe grade four injuries, which are really hemodynamically unstable, they felt that at that time, there was no real need to do the CT, but to go ahead and do your uh, resuscitative measures, your binder, your packing or embolization, whatever you need, reboa, etc. And then only after the patient is stabilized, you would go on to more investigations like the CT. Now, just briefly about the tile classification, again, is based on stability. A type are stable uh, fractures where the pelvic ring is stable. Uh, B types are partially stable injury where we say that the pelvis is rotationally unstable, but vertically unstable. And type C are the grossly unstable injuries. So stability, again, is dependent on the integrity of the posterior weight bearing sacroiliac complex and the pelvic floor. So here would be a B1 type of injury where it's an open book type of injury, anterior com uh, posterior compression, and you can see there's opening out of the symphysis pubis and an anterior opening of the posterior SI joint. So this would classify as a rotationally unstable but vertically stable injury. Uh, this type C where you can see there's opening out of the symphysis pubis, but there's a fracture and a vertical displacement of that entire hemipelvis, which would be become a vertically and rotationally unstable injury. Now, in terms of in, inter-observer reliability and uh, of the young Burgess and tile classification, the number of studies which tend to show that the young Burgess classification has a better inter-observer and intra-observer reliability, which is further uh, improved with the use of CT scans. Although, if you looked at the young Burgess classification, which first came out in a radiology journal in 1986 and in the Journal of Trauma in 1990, they were based on x-rays. Uh, finally, the AO OTA classification, which is the comprehensive classification, the pelvic fractures are 61. A is uh, what would come as a completely stable fracture, B incomplete uh, instability, and C is completely unstable fracture. So again, so rotationally unstable and vertically unstable. So you, in the type A fractures, you would have things like evulsions of the anterior spine or the ischial tuberosity. In the type B fractures, you would have incomplete, partially stable lesions. So there would be the B type of injury. So you, one B1 would be an external open book type of injury. Two would be an internal, that is a lateral compression type of unstable unilateral injury. And if this was bilateral, it would qualify as B3. And similarly, C-type injuries would be completely unstable on one side, okay? So if it was uh, completely unstable on one side while rotationally unstable on the other side, it would come as C3. Uh, while if it was rotationally, uh, vertically unstable on both sides, it would come as uh, C3, okay? So C1 would be that it's only a unilateral lesion. C2 would be unilaterally vertically unstable. On the opposite side, it's rotationally unstable, but vertically stable. And uh, C3 would be bilateral vertical instability of the lesions. Okay, so that is the classification that we need to look at uh, when we're dealing with pelvic fractures. Now, where does CT, of course, we all know that CTs are important, but basically, apart from the x-rays, which we talked about in detail in the earlier talk, you need CT scans for the details of the injury. It gives you a three-dimensional picture and imaging of the injury. Uh, posterior injuries are difficult to make out on x-rays. Undisplaced fractures may be difficult and combined pelvic and scapular fractures are difficult. So just to look at what details it provides you, there's an open book type of injury in a patient. Just a second. Sorry about that. Uh, phone had to ring at the wrong time. Okay, so open book type of injury. And uh, 
so this gives you more details. It shows you the details here. The, uh, that the sacrum is intact. You've got an opening of the anterior part of the SI joint here. And you can also see that there's some uh, ligamentous injury with bony avulsion from the sacrum here involving the floor of the pelvis. So these are the details that the CT will give you. Here's an elderly patient who first presented to me with this x-ray. This is some years ago. And then we got the inlet and outlet views and that's what it showed. But eventually it's the CT that really showed us that there was involvement here, but there was also involvement like a present fracture on the opposite side. And she also had an acetabular fracture on the same side. So these details, which are difficult to make out on conventional x-rays. The other uh, useful thing in, C in the CT scan is to look at if, you, if it's done in your own institution and you have the PACS system, it's good to see it on the console. You can see the moving images which work, start off at the lumbosacral spine, come down towards the pelvis. And as you can come down along the way, you can see how the sacrum is involved here. The fracture goes down extensively onto this side. Uh, with some dis, uh, displacement of the SI joint. And as you come down lower, you can see the crescent type of fracture on the opposite side. Uh, you go down further, you come to the level of the uh, hip joint. Okay, so you can see any injury uh, in the hip joint as well as you come down further. Uh, where as you reaching down to the area of the hip joint, you can see the head appearing here. Uh, and you, you can follow the scans down uh, carefully and actually map out the fracture very carefully uh, and look at them in detail. So you can see as we go down, there's some involvement of the acetabulum there. And uh, of course, this patient also had a subtrochanteric fracture on that side, which you can see lower down. You can look at the uh, coronal sections again in the same way to look at the fractures. They are coming from anterior to posterior and then you can see the 3D scans, look at the various angles at this 3D scans, which gives you a very good picture. But if you scan, some of the details get lost in the reconstruction into the 3D scan. So it gives you an overall picture, but not as good in details as your 2D scans. So I think uh, I will stop there. Uh, just to talk a little bit about some of the issues with CT scans. One is that Today, with the use of the pelvic binder, uh, don't rely on your initial x-rays completely. So this is a case report where a patient had CT scans, the x-rays were normal, and they actually felt there was no significant pelvic injury till about two days later when the binder was taken off and the patient started complaining and they did an x-ray without the binder. And you can see there's an opening out of the symphysis here and posteriorly, there's opening out of the SI, SI joint as well on the anterior side. So it was a great B, B type of injury, which they would have missed if they hadn't done the X-ray without the binder. And also more recently, they've looked at uh, uh, mathematical uh, sort of equations and uh, Okay, so take home, pelvic injuries can be serious life-threatening injuries. I think the classification should indicate severity of instability in these injuries and should also guide you on the management of these injuries. And of course, the role of CT is important in assessing uh, the nature of these injuries completely. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, there was some internet issues in the middle. Did that come through? Because I thought somewhere in the middle there was some internet problem was there yeah there a was a slight disruption at the yeah. end uh, so john just to uh, I, I don't know if and okay. so far i think no questions have come but i i want to put a one question to you john so for just the audience sake and for all our uh, our surgeons also what's the best classification for us to follow regarding pelvis so i think the young burgess is still probably the uh, 
best day-to-day uh, -day classification that you can follow. Uh, I think the AO comprehensive classification is more for uh, documentation purposes and really gives you an overall uh, look at all the injuries. But the standard uh, young Burgess would be uh, probably the most useful and the most widely used classification. Personally, I like the Marvin tile because it tells you uh, very simply whether it is rotationally uh, unstable and vertically stable or vertically both unstable, both rotationally and vertically. So I think any one of these is useful. I, you decide on one of them and use that in your practice. I think I, I see so when surgeons use? talk. When, yeah, no, so I, what I see is my own uh, thing when I go to these meetings, people interchange so frequently between one classification to the other that uh, you lose yeah. the uh, thing. You know, they just jump from one to the other uh, without realizing that they have now gone into I a different classification. I think you use uh, probably the best practice is to, for practical day to day use, stick to one classification. I mean, of course, for your research purposes, you might need to talk about other classifications as well. So uh, I think, uh, Dr. Gavaska, you can load on your presentation. In the meantime, Dr. Rajput, nice. I have one. Uh, uh, I, I want to have a consensus from all the faculty one by one quickly. Is it not important for all the uh, people who are learning? I mean, people who are in the residency or people who are in their early days of practice, they should be able to primarily assess the unstable and the stable between the two, as well as that WSES classification, which gives you the hemodynamically unstable and uh, mechanically unstable, those elements. Is it not necessary that before we jump to the young Burgess classification, at least that one point should be very clear in the mind of anybody who is into this practice? Yeah, absolutely. Think, absolutely. And that would come, I think, in the subsequent talks because resuscitation and management is was not part of the uh, talk as such. So I think, yes. So in the ones that are hemodynamically unstable, you need to get them stable before doing any further investigation. Exactly. So that was a build up to the next talk. Can I show a screen? Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Gaskar, please do. Yeah. So can you see? Yeah, it's seen. If you want to go full screen. Yeah. Yeah, all good. Just a moment. Yeah. Okay. So good morning. Good morning, everyone. Like, uh, so I, I, I would touch upon like, uh, how to treat, uh, how to treat uh, emergency, how to, how to do an emergency treatment for pelvic fractures. Like when we say about the emergency treatment of pelvic fractures, we most often focus about uh, bleeding pelvic injury, where we try to achieve hemostasis and bleeding control rather than looking at the skeletal stabilization part of it, which of course is important, but occupies only a small part of it. So the learning outcomes for this lecture would be to discuss techniques on how to do an immediate pelvic tamponade to reduce pelvic volume by using external compression devices, understand the right mix of diagnostics that are absolutely needed for a patient with a bleeding pelvic injury, because whatever you do in terms of diagnostic has to run along with resuscitation and not interfere with that. We will try to critically discuss the definitive modalities that can be used to achieve bleeding control. I'll also try to stress upon the importance of having a protocol-based algorithmic approach, which is extremely important if you reduce mortality in these patients. So if you look at mortality after a pelvic fracture, if you, according to this paper in 2008, it is around 20 percentage for a closed fracture. And that goes up to almost 45 percentage if you have an open fracture. And if you have a bleeding pelvic fracture, almost two out of three will die if they don't get immediate resuscitative treatment. So this being such a dreadful injury, if you want to have good outcomes and reduce mortality, you need to have a robust system that will require multiple facets of healthcare coming together and work in a coordinated manner. You may be a really skillful surgeon, but your expertise alone will not be enough 
apart from your expertise you need immense resources you need a multidisciplinary team and that team should be driven by well defined modern protocols so that the entire thing works like clockwork without any undue delay so if you look at the basic outline of emergency treatment in a bleeding pelvic injury it sort of revolves around these three facets you need to achieve immediate pelvic stabilization by external devices which create a tamponade and creates the first clot which is the most effective because subsequent clots will not be as effective because you tend to use up all your coagulative uh, uh, resources and resuscitation app has to happen concurrently you need to institute a multiple trans sorry massive transfusion protocols if required and run pertinent diagnostics and then you need to achieve bleeding control in a definitive manner by using different techniques which i will discuss later and often these things do not run in a sequential manner they run concurrently so it's not that one thing leads on to the other so a multidisciplinary team will work on achieving all these things more or less at the same time so the first step is to achieve a temporary pelvic tamponade by using an external comp external compression device most often in our setup we use a pelvic binder but because that is what ambulances have and that is what the paramedical guys are taught to but if we receive a patient in our er my er guys prefer to do a pelvic sheet as well which have taught them because this can allow us to do some interventions without removing the effect or the benefits of a external compression device so whatever you use it will help and it has been shown to that uh, pelvic binder has the ability to improve survival reduce transfusion requirements and also reduce hospital stay and this is irrespective of any fracture pattern especially in an apc and a vertical shear injuries so regardless of any any fracture pattern any classification that you follow if you have a patient with hemodynamic instability with a pelvic fracture an external compression device definitely helps more or less so the next thing is to what kind of diagnostics do i need to run in a patient with an exsanguinating pelvic injury if you look at this example the question that comes to mind is like yes the ct scan is useful as dr john sir showed to understand the different facets of a fracture but do i need it in an emergency setting definitely not in a fract in a patient like this all i need to make a diagnosis that is going to guide my resuscitative treatment is an ap pelvis x ray that can be taken in a bedside manner on a radiolucent couch so imaging in a pelvic injury will actually depend on the patient status if the patient is hemodynamically stable if you can you can run all kinds of diagnostics but if you have a patient with hemodynamic instability you need to focus on techniques that will diagnose things quickly and can be carried out as part of your resuscitative measures without hampering it so if you look at this is an bedside ap pelvis x ray if you look at this for an example you can make out a lot of things the patient has got a right superior pubic rami fracture you can also look at a left sacroiliac disruption you can also have an idea about a fracture in the left iliac wing a fracture of the right inferior pubic ramus as you can see in this asymmetry of the obturator foramens and you can also understand asymmetry in both vertical and rotational planes so this gives you a whole lot of information which is good enough to guide resuscitative management so what next so you have made your primary diagnosis and your patient is bleeding at this point you need to exclude you know your pelvic fracture can bleed but you also need to exclude other sources of extra pelvic bleeding the most common site you need to focus as the abdomen so the one quick way to go about abdominal bleeding is to do a focused assessment by sonography in trauma where you use an ultrasound to focus on specific zones to identify an intraperitoneal bleed you can also do an extended fast where you include the thoracic cavity as well but the problem with fast is some papers have said it is not as sensitive as it should be because the disruption in the pelvic fracture can disturb the abdominal pelvic anatomy which will hamper the ultrasound to pick up an intraperitoneal bleed but if you look at the modern studies most of them say an ultrasound a fast technique is pretty good enough to 
identify most of the intraperitoneal bleeds. So if you have doubts, you can always combine it with a diagnostic peritoneal tap, which is actually oversensitive. Which will, which is, if you are going to rely on a DPT alone, you, there is a possibility that you might end up doing a lot of negative laparotomies. So there is a possibility that you can combine these two things so that to make it more reliable if you need. And if you have a diagnostic peritoneal tap where you have more than 10 ml of fluid or frank blood, that is, that means more or less you are looking at an abdominal injury and you need to include a general surgeon into your uh, treatment strategy. So again, at this point, do I need a CT scan? Definitely no, because it requires shifting and whatever, however fast you can do a CT scan at this point of time, timing is all important and you do not want to stop or interfere with your resuscitation process. So you have done a fast, it is negative for an abdominal bleeding. You are resuscitating continuously following your transfusion protocols, but the patient's hemodynamic instability is still not improving. So what to do next? At this point, you need to think about achieving definitive control of the massive bleeding. There are two ways to do it. One is to do a preperitoneal pelvic packing. It is better to use or probably recommended to use it with an external fixator. After a peritoneal packing, you can come continue to use a pelvic binder as well, but you need to be careful about using a binder for a long time because it can cause skin problems. So it is better to convert to an external fixator before you do a pelvic packing so that any kind of packing that you do will effectively work better with a control with a, with a pelvis that uh, where the volume is uh, controlled, it can't keep expanding. And the other school of thought is to do uh, diagnostic angiography and therapeutic embolization. This was a very popular technique previously, but uh, we, have, we are continuously trying, uh, uh, trying to move away from it as your primary mode of bleeding control. So if you look at angioembolization, this used to be a very popular technique in the early 90s, sorry, late 90s and early 2000s with success rates of around 75 to 100 percentage. But the problem with uh, doing an angioembolization or using it as your primary modality is that arterial bleeding accounts for less than 20 percentage in a bleeding pelvic injury. Most of this bleeding comes from mid-sized pelvic vessels, which are actually amenable for embolization, but the uh, but if you use it as a primary modality, most often you will miss out a lot of other things. And if you are, and it also equ uh, requires a lot, uh, it may not be available in every resource and it requires a lot of expertise. And the mean time to undergo an embolization, even the best possible setups is around 130 minutes. So, and if you look at this time frame, only around 11 to 45 percentage ultimately end up going, undergoing embolization. So this as a primary uh, modality for achieving definitive bleeding control may not be the most effective way. And there has been a huge paradigm shift after the 2010s, and I'll come to that. So if you, but, but if your institution still follows uh, 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 embolization as a primary modality for achieving bleeding control, Contra CT might have a role in order to eliminate the unnecessary need for an invasive angiogram. Because if you have a contrast exacerbation on CT scan in the, in the arterial phase, then it suggests a strong need for embolization. And it's got a quick turnaround time. And if negative, you can avoid an invasive angio. So it saves a time and a lot of expertise. So contrast CT does have a role if you are having a angio embolization as your primary treatment protocol. But what we do in our setup is like we rely on the other school of thought that is preperitoneal pelvic packing. This was not a new technique. This was described way back in 1994-95 by Tim Coleman in Germany, where they use an X fix and then uh, use packs to pack the preperitoneal cavity to provide pelvic tamponade. And this technique has been shown to reduce mortality significantly compared to uh, the protocol by angioembolization. So if you look at the mortality rates for bleeding pelvic fractures, it was lowering around 60%. Then it came down to around 40 percentage with NG embolization. And then with pelvic packing, it's around 20 to 25 percentage. So this technique has gained immense popularity once the North American surgeons adopted it after the early 2010s. And now it's probably kind of standard of care to treat a bleeding pelvic fracture in order to achieve definitive bleeding control. So it is an easy technique, takes around 15 minutes and five minutes for a couple of supraacetabular wins to complete it. It controls most of the venous bleed and bleed 
uh, and it can even control mid-sized arterial bleed as well. So it can actually reduce the need for angiography. It does not require any special expertise, not IN resources. And the only downside is you need to remove them. The initial papers looked at 48 hours. But now most surgeons will remove it at 24 hours because the infection rates almost double up if you keep the packs for 48 hours. The infection rate is still around a 10 to 15 percentage, which is sort of pretty much acceptable for an injury like that. So temporary skeletal stabilization is again an important part of treating a bleeding pelvic fracture. We rely on a couple of supraostabular pins uh, to do an external pelvic stabilization. It is much better than iliac pins, especially in controlling rotation. And if you are really fast enough and uh, if you have the uh, expertise and skill set, you can also do posterior pelvic ring injuries by using an anti-shock screw or a resuscitation screw as uh, noted by Chip route. But uh, uh, this, can, this can really help as well because whatever fixator you do, even a supraostabular pin may not actually get the perfect control of a posterior pelvic ring. But this, 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 these don't have to be exactly accurate. You can actually, this can be provisional, this can be temporary, and you can always revise it at your definitive fixation. So temporary skeletal stabilization, external fixator is the main tool. Posterior pelvic ring injury stabilization, it's, uh, it's actually optional. So our protocol, like uh, what we do is like we've adapted it from Denver Health Medical Center where I did a small fellowship. Like, so what our, our patients come in a pelvic binder, as I said, in the ambulance, like, but if we receive them in the ER straight away, we put them on a sheet. We institute a massive uh, transfusion protocol if required in a ratio of one is to one is to one is to one is to one. And then like if we do a fast and diagnostic peritoneal tap and if it is negative and our patient is not improving, where Patients BP do not pick up beyond 90 systolic after two units of packed RBCs and one liter of crystalloids using a rapid transfusion technique within 10 minutes. It indicates ongoing hemodynamic instability. So in these patients, they are termed non-responders and we take them to the OR and we do supraostabular pins and preperitoneal packing with two to six, sorry, four to six packs on either side of the bladder, filling up from posterior to anterior. And after this, most often you will see the patient's hemodynamic stability picking up within five to 10 minutes. And if it doesn't, it indicates persistent instability and you may be looking at major vessel bleeding, which is often arterial. And this is where embolization comes up. We used to do a contrast CT before and then subject to patients, subject patients to embolization, whoever has a positive extravasation. But recent papers have shown that if you follow this kind of a protocol where you do a peritoneal packing first and then embolization as a secondary technique, then you don't need a CT actually because most patients whom you subject to embolization after a peritoneal packing often have an arterial bleed. So you can sort of eliminate a CT there and straight away go to an angiography. So this is what I was talking about. This is a paper published from the Denver group like using this protocol. And using this protocol, they were able to take the patient to over much earlier at around 42 minutes, where they did a preperitoneal pelvic packing and an external fixator. And they were able to achieve bleeding control in 83% of the time. And the remaining patients underwent an angiography. And when they underwent an angiography, they found out that 80% of these patients had positive findings for an arterial bleed on angio and had underwent curative embolization. So this kind of a protocol really works well. So in summary, if you have a bleeding pelvic fracture, you need to understand whether the patient is hemodynamically stable or not. If the patient is hemodynamically stable, but you've got an unstable pelvic injury, then you go ahead and do all your diagnostics and plan for definitive fixation. But if you have a patient who's got hemodynamic instability, then you decide whether the patient uh, is unstable and you go ahead on this protocol, start resuscitating, resuscitating put the patient on a external fixator and the preperitoneal packing. And if it's still unstable, go on to a pelvic arteriography and do an embolization. And once it has become stable, do your fracture management. And if you have an abdominal injury concurrently, then obviously you got to include the GI surgeons as well. And you have to understand that you have to work together and an abdominal injury takes precedence. So in summary, take home messages would be like, if you have a bleeding pelvic injury, timing is the key. You the treatment has to be multidisciplinary. It has to be driven by teams and using well-defined protocols. 
You have to focus on achieving immediate tamponade by using external compression devices. You have to understand that it works for all fracture patterns, may not be the same for all, but it works. CT is often considered the tunnel of death in a patient with a bleeding pelvic injury, definitely not needed at this time. Preperitoneal pelvic packing is considered a standard of care in a non-responder to achieve bleeding control. Injury embolization does have a role as a secondary treatment modality. It complements PPP and should be a part of your treatment armamentarium. Thank you. That was a great talk, uh, Dr. Gavaskar. Now, for uh, benefit of people who are working in setups where probably they don't have all the, uh, you know, all the multidisciplinary people all together with them. So, most of the orthopedic institutes, standalone institutes, or most of the mid sized corporates, they do have a CT scan. They, of course, they have ultrasound. But getting a patient into a CT scan and back is much faster than getting a patient into ultrasound and back. So that concept of tunnel of death, would you revise as per the institute's uh, own uh, merits and demerits? Uh, yes, like uh, I, you don't need to shift the patient for an ultrasound yeah, for actually. Person, yeah. So everything happens in the ER. All you require is uh, somebody who can do an ultrasound. The ER team should be trained to do it. Not a difficult technique actually. And uh, and it is not expensive as well. If, so if a center can have a CT, having a ultrasound in the ER is not expensive actually. So uh, of course, like uh, it, it involves training actually keeping, uh, that's why I said like you need to have protocols in place, like without protocols in place and things working without thinking, uh, you will lose a lot of patients because timing is important. So I don't uh, accept that uh, CT is better. No, no, I'm not saying CT is better. I'm saying CT is faster. And another problem which I have very frequently faced, I don't know about you, is that our GI surgeon or any general surgeon is not ready to take uh, ultrasound on its face value and they will always want a confirmation by CT with contrast for abdominal injury. Yes, like uh, I understand exactly. But so, so if you have a, a positive fast or a diagnostic tap, okay, which indicates an intra-abdominal bleed, and you have a pelvic fracture that is not too bad, then probably focus shifts onto the abdominal thing. And yes, yes, contra CT and this, in that scenario is not a bad choice, actually. Yeah, and one of the things that which we see happens very often is that when the general surgeons take over, they kind of don't inform you when they are taking the patient to R. Okay, I think it's very important, this communication that even if they're doing a laparotomy, that's the best time for you to put on your external fixator. Exactly. And they'll, pro and they'll probably bring up yeah, the colostomy wound right where you want to put any fixation. Exactly. So exactly. the best time to do it is actually before they do the laparotomy. Yeah, but only, but only thing is like uh, if you are packing, uh, intra-abdominal packing doesn't work very effectively. That is intra-peritoneal packing that is, doesn't work very effectively. So I think like packing has to be uh, pre-peritoneal. So, uh, yeah, yeah. You Absolutely. Must... There's no doubt about that. So I think just uh, for the sake of uh, our own satisfaction, Let's look at our combined packing experience. So, John, how many uh, packings have you done? We, we, so, this is the issue that we, I think we've done one in all these years. Right. Because I think these patients... It's okay, John, just the number. No, I'm you? just saying they die before they come to yeah, you. Yeah, true. So, Abhay, I, you? I, I think Abhay, Ashwinibas, you? No, not one. Not one. Ashok? Two, two, two. Two, okay. And uh, so, that's one Ashok. Yeah, Ashok, Raju? So, okay, I, I have done, I have done, like, uh, my numbers are still in one only, like, uh, less so, than 10. I think Dr. Sen, is he around? Yes, definitely, just one. Then one. So, you see, I mean, we talk about this a lot, but if you look at our experience, and we are some of, uh, you have been operating for 10, 15 years. I think problem is getting these patients to our hospital. They die probably there before they're reaching us. Uh, yeah. Uh, maybe I should that part you can include sure. in your talk next time that somehow we need to develop our traumas, uh, ambulance services to bring this patient scoop and bring quickly to the hospital. I think Vivek might have more experience. He's in a good place for all this. So a couple of things like I, I've done less than 10 only for peritoneal pack. Uh, the problem is like, yes, we do not have a referral system in place. Like ambulances bring them fast. Okay. But like they bring, they get the patient to an hospital that is nearby. So yeah, yeah. the problem is we do not have a concept of a tired system. So we don't have a referral system in place. One. And then second thing is like, 
uh if you want to do this like most often you may have to overdo things actually like uh, say like you have done 10 peritoneal packings like uh, probably four or five may not have actually not been required. needed yeah exactly okay like but if you have a protocol okay like yes, my systolic bp doesn't improve after this within this time i am going to taking for a pre peritoneal packing probably the patient might not have needed it as well but that is how we need to do it so i think that's what uh, yeah that's what polman said when he came to uh, deliver the exactly the same talk actually in um, one of the meetings here he exactly said the exactly same thing that you need to be doing lot more um, to save uh, and know actually which one you should have done so that this becomes uh, also this becomes very difficult in private setups okay because you take the patient to war anything happens then becomes your responsibility then you agree yeah. counseling is an issue again yeah huge so, issue again, actually Mm. Yeah, huge issues. Like, like my last hospital when I had a kid of ten, ten uh, age. Like these guys were counseling her about long term effects, long term problem. I said, like she won't live for thirty minutes. So, like, <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> so I think it's very difficult to uh, make your uh, other colleagues understand as well. So because everybody comes into play in a private setup, mm. the interventional radiologists, general surgeons, everybody comes into play. So I think it's important to build up a team there and uh, do it. So and one question. Uh, yeah so and that one, brings to the from... that brings us to the crux of the matter which is that every institute has to set up its own protocols however small exactly. it may be however limited it may be in terms of resources but they have to set up their own protocols as per their resources and start following it and reevaluate it at periodic uh, you know periodic intervals and pre hospital care needs to be strengthened in the country So sorry, uh, one question from my side, like on the topic. Uh, anyone uh, experience with the Rebova? I was just going to ask you that. <laughs> experience <laughs> with what? Uh, uh, Rebova, yes, sir. Rebova, sir. Like end of us, the balloon occlusion. Balloon, balloon. Okay. Balloon. No. Where they occlude the descending aorta? We using end of us the balloon. You can do it at zone one. That is like above the celiac trunk or below the renal vessel. Zone three. I have seen it in US. Like uh, my yeah. my IR team is ready to do it. but like we haven't had a case so far like any experience uh, anyone like does it work well at least what we can see from the literature it is supposed to work in selected cases the problem with us is to have everything ready at the time because these cases whenever they come they probably unless you uh, as already said the protocols are not there it's very difficult to do them i think vivek is keeping quiet uh, maybe he can tell us whether what's happening in his center there <laughs> i think he has told that uh, most of these things are taken care by their uh, when i had a talk with him that the general surgeons that is uh, who take care most of the time they open up they ligate the blood vessels they don't hesitate oh, as far as i know that yeah. is not yet yeah, yeah, i think yeah, vivek yeah. Back, so yeah. what his center does is they do a common iliac ligation they do yeah. a pre peritoneal packing and if need be uh, instead of just doing an angio first up the very go to uh, the common iliac ligation and yeah, i think that with the pay paper also 100 or 200 patients so uh, we have somebody behind there some voice coming can you mute there's some voice coming from somebody behind so i would say that uh, yes everybody name seems to know what we do at our aims so that's the best thing which can happen to propagate what should be done in an emergency management of pelvis and the we follow the world guidelines but yes we have slightly modified it as per the indian circumstances because the embolization is not so commonly done in our hospital we yeah. have been doing it for pelvis for livers and spleens but for pelvis you require it round the clock so that's not a possible thing so we do if the patient is in extremis the first thing to do is a pelvic binder if the patient does not respond with the hemodynamic infusions then we take him to the or take him for a pre peritoneal packing in which we along with our surgeon team we always have a trauma team of orthopedics and pel or a trauma surgeon who take care of a pelvis fracture there has to be two people both the surgeon and the pel and the orthopedic surgeon we do the peritoneal packing if it is not improving then and he is in extremis then we do a internal artery uh, iliac artery ligations bilateral that's a very old method but it's the same as a embolization but in a crude manner but what we have found as abhay was saying of 200 odd cases that yes it has been effective and the trauma surgeons do that for us and 
till the time we do not have a proper embolization facilities where we can do it round the clock with a very efficient within very fast time i think that has saved many patients for us in our hospital okay i think srinivas you want to start yes. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. So my topic is anterior ring fixation for pelvis. So this is a statement from uh, Tiles textbook. The single most important determinant of biomechanics of pelvis is its structure, ring structure, and surgical recon reconstruction of the complete ring has the greatest restorative effect. to give back its stability so that is very very important and uh, anterior ring is an important part of it it can be from anterior part of the acetabulum to the pubic symphysis uh, including pubic rame and body of pubis and uh, of course purely ligamentous disruption may also be there which is uh, a symphysis pubis disruption but isolated pubic symphysis disruptions uh with a big opening doesn't occur unless you have a posterior element uh disrupted so this is just an example of a 50 year old man uh with uh, open big kind of an injury you can make out right si joint is also open so i just want to show you one video in this particular thing so this is a, a video which i have taken in grass uh during uh, 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 uh cadaveric course so uh, where a symphysis is cut and i am trying to open the pelvis but it is not opening right so with a huge force it only happens when you cut the anterior si ligament and intraosseous ligament then only it happens to open the symphysis that means any big opening which has an indication for restoring stability always has a posterior component so which is very very important to restore while doing uh, anterior fixation so in this particular case a uh, regular fan and steel incision and uh, rectus uh, cut and then fixed with a symphysis pubis plate but before that after getting anterior reduction as i told the posterior fixation is equally important to give the stability to the ring it's not just anterior alone so in this case right si joint which was open was also fixed and uh, after that come back to symphysis and uh, fixed with a plate on the superior surface so that is the outcome so symphysis pubis uh, disruption has got numerous uh, internal fixation methods uh, which includes screws wires although i don't have any experience with uh, wires and you know uh, circlage wire as well as tension band wire are also described and uh, uh, the plates dual plating constructs superior plate and anterior plate so uh, what i feel is minimum six hole plate should be uh, available and uh, superior has relatively good strength as it has long enough screw lengths and both superior and anterior plating if it is uh, doable then that gives more stability compared to a single plate and this is the biomechanical uh, study uh, which was published in injury where in tension band wiring uh, with the suture button uh, has also equal stability in terms of anterior restoration compared with plating so one important thing is Uh, dr john sir also mentioned so by the time patient comes to casualty most of the times it, there is already a pelvic binder which might have reduced the symphysis pubis this is one particular case of a 40 year old man uh, this is a ct scan so most of the people they uh, uh, the ct scan is done outside and come back to tertiary referral and uh, if you see the x ray you can see the initial x ray shows opening open pelvis Uh, whereas uh, the ct scan shows almost normal so predicting the dynamic stability instability with the static image is challenging so one has to 
uh, keep an eye about uh, dynamic stability and examine uh, in person in the casualty itself and uh, it is difficult to arrive at consensus whether to fix anterior uh, orf uh, for symphysis just based on the image uh, i would prefer to examine myself and see the dynamic stability so that is after fixation of the same patient pubic ramus fracture component when it is associated with pubic ramus component you can say this is one 17 year old boy you know uh, met with uh, a road traffic accident you can see left si disruption with uh, left pubic uh, ramus fracture which is displaced and you know uh, hitting onto the bladder although bladder injury was not there and in this case uh, i had to use a plate and how long the plate can go you can go up to suprastabular area and uh, you know beyond uh, the acetabulum and then fix it in this case that was the outcome after an year and the plate can go on both the sides uh, bridging uh, uh, both the uh, you know symphysis when it is uh, when it has a anterior ring involving both side uh, superior and inferior pubic ramus and unstable Uh, length of plate can vary from 16 to 18 hold in this particular case it was a 16 hold which i have used so in combined pelvic acetabular injuries something like this the acetabular congruity is very very important along with your uh, stability of the pelvis and in order to mobilize the patient also you have to fix the pelvis and which should even aid in restoring the congruity at the uh, acetabulum which needs uh, longer plates and uh, bridging both the side whenever it is needed in this case uh, right side acetabulum was gone and uh, uh, i had to put a plate from uh, right side to uh, left uh, superior pubic ramus and uh, got a congruity at the acetabulum as well that is her function after 8 months the indication for anterior external ring fixation is uh, dr sunil gavaskar has uh, in the last class, uh, last talk mentioned emergency stabilization uh, in an unstable patient with an unstable fracture uh, pattern and uh, definitive stabilization uh, in case of rotationally unstable injury where you don't have a clean uh, anterior skin either by you know laparotomy or by Uh, you know urology uh, urological procedure and definitive stabilization can also be done in i'll give you one example uh, where uh, unstable chair kind of an injury with significant soft tissue moral level leak and effusion the external fixation can be supraacetabular pins and iliac crest pins but just supraacetabular pins can give you a significant stability which is compared to uh, plate itself in the symphysis so here is a 45 year old lady uh, with a moral level lesion pneumoperitoneum and uh, presented in shock like it was discussed so resuscitated uh, and then took uh, 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 the, as there was a pneumoperitoneum sigmoid colon rupture emergency laparotomy was done and there was a anterior incision already so i had to uh, discuss with the uh, gastroenterologist surgical gastro uh, to Uh, place uh, you know colostomy relatively superior location but in this case i had to use a supraacetabular pin to get uh, stability anteriorly which was continued uh, for about 3 uh, months and that is uh, her function after uh, any year so after it has healed and the colostomy is closed the intramedullary fixation the, uh, the wide spectrum of variable Uh, variability between the curve and obliquity of the superior pubic ramus uh, gives the osseous fixation pathway which is relatively complex in case of uh, anterior ring and uh, the most important views here to have is uh, pelvic inlet view and obturator outlet view which are important and these are the osseous pathways through which you pass uh, minimal invasive screw fixation here is a 21 year old uh, with a run over kind of an injury and bladder injury uh, you can see the symptoms there so that is with the pelvic binder itself 
and uh, the prerequisites are uh, you know radial descent table which is very very important and residual bladder contrast should not be there and uh, complete paralysis these are the views which are uh, already described by uh, dr rakesh rajput uh, obturator oblique and uh, inlet views so this is where uh, i had to use two 3.5 mm uh, screws for uh, uh, anterior uh, ring fixation through retrograde uh, percutaneous screw with a small incision and uh, posterior si joint screw urethroplasty was done after 2 months and that is after 6 months of you know outcome you can see the healing of the pubic ramen and here is a 35 year old uh, female ran over injury uh, moral level lesion late presentation and vertically unstable injury you can see the vulval injury and perianal laceration and uh, all that is degloved and uh, in these cases you know your soft tissue won't allow you to fix it posteriorly it's only anterior fixation initially with the uh, uh, suprastabular pins followed by uh, once a patient got stabilized and the posterior part started to heal uh, i had put plates and uh, although the reduction is not good that is 2 years post operative outcome of the same patient you can see the uh, vertical uh, displacement but the ring is stable and the patient is able to do her activities in conclusion the associated injuries dictate the approach which is more commonly associated in case of a pelvic fracture almost 20 to 30% of the times you have got associated injuries and one should know all the options and coming to symphysis pubis double plate has got more stability in compared to superior plating which is in turn uh, has better stability than anterior plate next comes is suprastabular external fixator and last is iliac wing external fixation thank you dr shrinivas would you mention a little bit about infix i don't think anybody else is going to include in yeah. this talk <laughs> yeah so infix i, I personally I, i don't have any experience but it it is considered to be uh, equal to your suprastabular uh, uh, x fix but your uh, anterior rod will be subcutaneously placed and uh, i think uh, sunil gavaskar has some experience sorry yes sir uh, yes any was like sorry yeah you are audible yeah like i i have used it in a few cases like uh, where i have a open injury or a spc in place like where i cannot uh, or don't want to go there in first place and also in some females like uh, where we want to avoid uh, hardware inside like but uh, infix is good uh, but there are weak spots in the infix like the interface uh, if you are using a pedicle screw probably not as strong as a, uh, a plate anteriorly so you have to use it cautiously but there are cases where you can use it but it requires removal as well we remove it routinely remove it around 4 to 6 months time so you have to be careful in very thin thin patients okay because you can cause uh, pressure over the femoral nerve and neurovascular structures as well yeah we have been doing quite a lot of infix right now and our experience has been mostly in those cases which were i would say very obese patients yeah they are the That's ideal obvious. cases where you do not want to go into the symphysis very deep down around 10 inches down uh, bmi of more than 35 40 even we had cases of 42 43 bmi so in those cases it was easier to go with infix and my preference and indications are those cases as open fractures as sunil said and obese patients where i don't want to get in and get that plates the only tip and trick is that you keep your pedicle above the psoas because then as john is saying regarding that femoral nerve damage and the bending and the pressure which happens with the plate with the rod that you can avoid the second thing is the bending of the uh, that rod that is a very critical thing that you need to ensure that it bends from the edges as well because if you don't do that 
it is going to press on to the psoas and the femoral nerve, which is a quite a common complication which was reported in JOT as well regarding this infix. Yeah. So, so if, 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 one, if it's prominent, then in a thin patient, it becomes yeah, a exactly. So my, my indication is to do it in obese patients and they are very happy with that. And I'm yeah, also as a surgeon, true. very happy doing, <laughs> not going inside and fixing it. <laughs> 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 one one question question like, for this thing is one with associated urological injuries when there is a lot of repair done. In that scenario, you do not want to put any hardware and that is one of our indications where we are using reasonably often the infix also. And definitely for relatively definitely fixation where there is a lot of crushing anteriorly and you feel your anterior dissection is likely to be too much. So getting an infix is a much safer kind of a situation, obviously taking care of the right level of uh, its placement. Uh, one question on uh, we're using it in obese patients like... Uh, uh, one thing is like if you are since you need to keep the screws above the fascia like uh, one thing is like you're going to require long screws really like uh, another thing is like oh by, since we have concerns about the biomechanical strength of it like uh, since you come too far the lever keeps increasing as well in an obese patient so have you come across hardware problems you are muted Vivek Not right now in the obese patients. And in fact, the COVID has given me that opportunity that I have not been able to remove them in most of my cases. And one or two have come back to me and they are still okay. What, I'm, what, what I have done is I've got special pedicle screws which have been made and they are more than 100, 110 centimeter, uh, millimeters in size. They are at least 8.5 to 9.5 pedicle which have been specially built for these with a the UA multipolar or polyaxial screws, because normally you get 60 particular screws, which are just of 6.5 and maximum seven. So I have screws which have been built, which are nine, 9.5 and going up to 110, 120. And you have around 30 to 40 mm, which is above the AIIS. So that, that's how it gives me that flexibility that the inside the pelvis also, there is roughly 70 millimeters of uh, my purchase and around 30 to 40 millimeters, which is above that. And in fact, in one or two in which we obviously, as you said, we need to remove them. We have removed them and it, I removed them nearly one year to 1.5 1, 1. years later. And right now I will be having a spate of them when the COVID finishes that I'll be removing them. So we didn't have any issues of that. Yes, there is a mild change in the symphysis, which happened when I started. He's walking on it completely for the last one year. Uh, for the few since COVID is there. So they didn't have any much problems because the slight deformation of the symphysis did happen, the diastasis part, but not in a grotesque manner, just like an external fixator. Vivek, one more thing, like you said yeah. about the increased diameter of the screws, but like, I don't think that is the weak part, uh, actually the rod, what happens to the rod? Your rod goes bigger as well? The rod is, th uh, rod is same. No, there, is a, there is a problem which we have faced it because we also have those specially long kind of those uh, screws over there. The stress which is coming over to that uh, rod junction is one area which doesn't really bear that kind of a load when you make the patient accommodatory. And we have failed twice in uh, those uh, stability and the rod has come out. Mm -hmm. uh, my, uh, uh, one thing which I like to say is that when you are doing an infix, it's not just the infix or the interior fixations which you are doing. I am very well backing up my posterior fixations very adequately. I put in two or three iliosacral screws out there. And along with that, to supplement my posterior fixation, these infix are being done. They are not being done in an opposite manner just to ensure that the entire instability of the pelvis is being taken care of by the infix. So I feel for that matter, they are able to take care of that stability part. I ensure my posterior stability is perfect with iliosacral screws in such cases. And the interface probably will be stronger with monoaxial than with the polyaxial screws. Yes, true. I agree. So there is an oblique screw also, which has got an oblique way, uh, sort of an. Since you uh, just have to connect two, you don't particularly need polyaxial. So screws. you have some oblique fashioned particular screws also, which an angle, and maybe, but again, the angle gives you an issue, which will be a weak point. So that's the thing also. I have a question. I think the most it's important thing which uh, uh, Vivek has pointed out is. Other than the two fall guys, which are the rod and the rod screw junction, uh, it is basically that you can't be doing it as a standalone thing. So no. 
you have obviously very sure that your posterior stability is there because in any case even if there is a slight symphysial disruption or if there is a mild anterior instability those patients do tend to do very well so uh, and the other thing is probably the polyaxial screws are better because if you do it in an obese patient then uh, you can't always be very sure of uh, finding a, a perfect tunnel uh, from one aiis to the other aiis as so uh, probably from uh, technical convenience point of view i think the polyaxial sure, screws i'm sure that's it's we used it initially easier. but were not very happy with a very fidgety fixation so for probably not use it then use it but yes definitely for the indications that we mentioned they are very very important things yes i think we now start with dr vivek trikha uh, my slide is visible Okay, so I'll start with thank you IOA and AOPAS for giving me this opportunity. I will be speaking on iliosacral screws indications. The indications for all iliosacral screws is an unstable sacroiliac joint complex, like an opening of the SI joint, or of displaced and disimpacted sacral fractures. In fact, any of the case which you want to fix for the posterior pelvis, iliosacral screw is a very good option, which can be used and can be used by anyone anywhere in the country. why do we use them because it's a minimally invasive it gives us less comorbidities less blood loss is there wound healing problems are less and once you are okay with that and understand what's how it is to be done you will have a very less operative time and providing adequate and very great fixation when to use it as sunil had shown in resuscitation screw in emergencies where you can use them or you can also use them as a definitive fixation for a definitive fixation of the pelvis and the posterior side coming to the screw positions remember that we are dealing with two fracture types one is the si joint dislocations and one is the sacrum so we i want to ensure that our screws are going as perpendicular to the fracture or to the joint as possible to get a complete compression and not giving us a shear effect so the screws will be different and posi position of them will be different so let's keeping that in mind we see that in this fashion if the si joint dislocation was there we have put in two screws from the left side and in the sacral fractures what we see we have tried to be as perpendicular to the fracture to give compression and in the outlet views we can see that we have put these screws in the s1 in one side on the si joint and s2 on the opposite side which shows us that correct screw direction for a specific and individual fracture pattern is very much important and that's how you can ensure that you're getting good stability then let's come to what is common most important thing is pre op evaluation with a ct scan people might say that we look everything on an x ray we can see but remember that in a normal x ray and in a normal ct scan and in a normal pelvis you have an osseous corridor which is roughly 1.5 to roughly 2 2 cm thick in the s1 region where you can put in the screws but remember that there is a sacral dysmorphism which is common very common especially in our country as well as in all the other countries as well where the osseous corridor can be very small less than 10 mm and here you might have to put in a screw which has angle will change and the corridor will be very small so always get a ct scan to get and be sure that there is no dysplasias uh, the study by i think by chip rout could show that there were nearly 50% cases where the ct of the pelvis and the posterior side was not as what you wanted for the screws to be put in now we come to what are the structures at risk remember you are going into from bone to bone in here so you have the ureter and the l5 nerve roots which are going on the sacral ala you have the sacral canal on the posterior side you have the common iliac arteries on the front which are bifurcating into the external and the internal iliacs and the ureters just going adjacent to them so you have to ensure that your screws are going just into that promontory area or into the bone remaining there and not going into these vital structures which if are damaged can have catastrophic results besides this you also have all these nerves and the vessels which are there so we need to ensure that these are the structures which we will have to be ensuring that they are not getting damaged and we put the screw right at the place 
that brings us to what and how the proper surgical technique to be used here the most important thing is you can do it in both supine and prone positions drape freely the entire abdomen as well as because you might have to go open also if you want and the involved leg where you want to do the distractions and reductions Radi radiolucent table is preferable here always and always before draping see that you can get your outlet view properly as well as the lateral view many a times it will happen that you just scrub in get in and when you want to get the outlet view your base of your ot table is going to be hindering and you just cannot get the outlet view so get them them before and always use a very good image intensifier preferably with 9 inches diameter and beyond that which is around 12 inches that is going to help when we do it in a supine position what we try to do is keep the pelvis and the body elevated because it's not on the table we keep it around 6 inches more elevated because if you are putting in a si joint screw which here your screw direction has to be from posterior to anterior there your drill machine is going to be touching and obstructing the ot table so ensure that your screws and your table and the pelvis is higher around 4 to 6 inches so that you can get the proper trajectory which you want for putting in the iliosacral screw coming to the radiology this is where you want you want the sciatic notches to be perfectly lateral along with the iliac cortical density which are nothing but the si joint where the overlapping of the sacral ala transl uh, the calcal cortical bone as well as the iliac bone is happening entry point has to be inferior to the iliac cortical density so i am giving you this representation this is your iliac cortical density which is the sacral ala and the si joint and you can see that in all the three pictorial graphs that prominence of the triangle is your sacral promontory this is the posterior part of your sacral anterior canal rather this is your anterior sacrum and that one is your s1 s2 disc space so you see that your screw entry point has to be below the icd in the center preferably slightly on the more posterior aspect going into the anterior part once you are able to ensure that in a lateral view then you go in for an outlet view and try to see that you are going above the s1 neural foramina that's the foramina and your screw is going or the drill is going as an eyebrow or the eyelashes or eyebrow to the eye of the neural foramina then you look at the inlet view see whether your inlet view you are inside the sacrum and not going anterior to it or posterior into the sacral canal and thus preventing any damage to the vital organs then you further this drill guide right up to the opposite side and then you can put in your screw into this place we'll discuss the partially or the cannulated screws in the s2 if you want to put the screws the same thing is there you get a perfect lateral get the guide wire right in the center of it get a bull's eye so that you are able to get the proper planes of that and then you again put your s2 screw with a drill guide ensuring that your neural foraminas are separate and it is going between the s1 and s2 neural foramina both in s1 as well as in uh, in the inlet and the outlet views finally if you are looking after putting in the screws you should have two bull size as such the screws going right in between the s1 and the s2 and in the outlet views where you can see that they are going and not if you want you can put them transiliac or transsacral or else you can put them in whichever place you want and that's his post op images as i said they can there are screws which you can convert and put them into transiliac transsacral screws which was popularized 10 years back and this is the same trajectory and the same things which you do you just continue further and ensure like in the third image you can see that our drill bit on the s2 is going right beyond the opposite side of ilium and you are able to put in the screw which is transiliac transsacral screw getting a complete hold from one ilium to the other going through the sacrum the only problem with this is that you require a screw length which is around 150 to 160 mm and which may or may not be available to us especially in our country where i say i think 130 140 are the maximum and then you need to get indigenously developed screws whose strength may be in question when you are putting them and getting them to so much stress loading how to achieve optimal stability and what are the how many screws are adequate there are papers both for si joint dislocations as well as for sacral fractures 
which have shown that two sacroiliac screws are a must in an unstable pelvic injuries where you are doing it for a proper indication of disimpacted and displaced sacral fractures or widely displaced SI joint dislocations. One screw is adequate only for an undisplaced fracture, LC1 or LC2, mild LC1, I would say, just an undisplaced sacral fracture where your one screw is just holding that and reducing the pain. But two screws are a must if you are doing it for an unstable pelvic injury. And that you can put either in S1 or in S1 and S2 as the choice may be. Which screws to put? Normally, cannulated screws are put 7.5 to 8 millimeters. Partially threaded are the easily ones which you can get and available. So you can put them in 32 millimeters. Fully threaded screws are usually put for sacral fractures, but there are papers, especially from Alabama in Jason Lowy has shown that even if you put in partially threaded screws in a S2 or a zone two sacral fractures, there is not amount of compression that you can increase the neurological damages to them. This is our own paper where we studied the sacral morphologies and the, was, uh, the safe osseous corridors where we could see that in S2 screws, putting in a 7.3 mm screw with two millimeters of gaps on either side was difficult in nearly half of the patients. But in S1 screw, very easily you can put in 7.3 or even 8 mm screws without any problems. A few examples of how do we do this. This is a young patient, BSF soldier who had a widely displaced SI joint with a pubic rami fracture. You could see a mild sacral avulsions also. And the CT scan showed us the ideal indication for going in for an iliosacral screw. He was a very robust, a very high and tall built person where for the fixation part, we were able to get, we got one or two screws, not able to get a complete and good purchase or a compression out there. So we ended up putting in three screws in the sacrum, getting two screws in S1, one in S2, and augmented it with an interior fixation as well by putting in the screw in the pubic rami so that our posterior fixation just alone, not doing it anteriorly, will not be hand hampering the stability part. This is his follow-up images after one year where the things have completely united. And you can see that all the things are now united and this patient is able to do all his activities. Just to go about another 28 year old male having an APC two or a three type fracture or dislocations. Here, what you see in the CT scan is your dysmorphism. You can see there is a variation in this part of the sacrum where if you are very anterior and try to go into the promontory, you might be going in out in of the bone. And that's what you need to prevent and ensure. And that's why CT is very important when you try to get it beforehand. We fix that anteriorly. And since there was a very small corridor in the S1, we put in a small screw obliquely driven as I had shown in the CT scan in the S1. And then a S2 corridor in such dysmorphic sacrums are very big where you can put in the screws. So this is what we did, a small screw where you can see that the corridor is a small one. It is below this, that's the posterior border. And the S2 screw was put long enough to get a good hold on the posterior aspect. And this is how the sacral dysmorphic cases were taken and fixed with iliosacral screws on the back with a small in S1 and a major screw in the S2 screw. And that's his follow-up where you think you can see that the patient is having good stability even after one year. Coming to one or two examples in sacral fractures, as I said, undisplaced sacral fractures are a good way to learn how to put in an iliosacral screw, but the real thing and the real indication for putting in iliosacral screws are in widely displaced fractures where you reduce them. And then you can see that it's gone posteriorly as well as vertically higher up. You see them in prone position. I reduce them first by opening up from the backside you can see that this is how that image had gone. The vertical displacements were there. I reduced it and you can see that now that cortical continuity of the sacrum, ala and the interior part has been maintained. We fix it with K, stabilized it with K wires. And then like a routine thing, you just put in and fire in your screws in S1 and in S2 and get the adequate fixation, which you want with the staples showing you the opening as well as a complete reduction of the sacrum which had both anterior, posterior and vertical dimensions and displacements were taken care of. This is another case having a 22 year old lady fall from metro station, third floor high. And you can see the amount of displacements of the ileum of the inlets, as well as both posteriorly and superiorly 
how the sacrum has got displaced. And these were resuscitated first initially. You can see the pelvic bandaging with the towel clips out there initially, where it was done. Then when finally the sacrum and the CTs were done, we could see that it's a comminuted sort of a sacral fracture. Some people, and that might be an indication for some for doing a spinopelvic, but when you can reduce them properly and you can fix them with an opposite side hemipelvis and the hemisacrum, I think with adequate stability, you can get very good fixations, provided that you are giving good fixation on the posterior side of your pelvis with iliosacral screws. And that's what we did, sorry. We reduce, you can see in the first screws how the posterior sacrum has gone. We reduced it first prone with a shan spin in the AS and the post PSIS, and we could get a complete inlet continuity of the sacrum and the inlet view. Then, after reduction in a proper in vertical displacements were reduced, we fired in two screws for the S1 and the S2 part, getting good compression as well as good fixation, maintaining the displacements which had been reduced properly. And finally, the interior fixation was also done. And you can see the corresponding pre-injury and post-injury status with an inlet view and the outlet views and the AP views. And this was the view where the inlet view shows you the amount of displacement and how with just this amount of screw fixation and the interior fixation with symphysis, you can get adequate fixation without going into another level up, which might be required if you are not able to get it with iliosacral screws. This is her follow-up after one year. And you can see that everything is maintained and she is now going around happily with this. So I'll end by saying that remember iliosacral screw, you need to understand that you have to have an optimal indication for that. Then its use and benefits are immense and it can really, and it has changed the outcomes in posterior pelvic injuries to a great extent, making it available to all the surgeons who can fix it without any major problem morbidities to the patient. Correct screw pathway needs to be understood. Look always for lumbosacral dysplasias and fluoroscopy has to be very nice when you are fixing them. Accurate reduction is paramount. That reduction, if you are not able to get percutaneously by traction, you need to do open as I have shown in my sacral fractures. I open them, get anatomical reduction and then fix them. Safe surgical technique has described is a must so that you avoid damage to the vital organs and it becomes a very less morbid and a great procedure once you master that properly. I thank you for your hearing. Thank you very much, sir. That was a really lucid and very well uh, uh, taught technique for iliosacral screws. Uh, Dr. Pradeep Nimade, are you ready with your talk? Yes. In the meantime, if there is any question to Dr. Trika. Uh, Vivek, uh, one question. Um, normally, uh, when you do this, uh, because I've seen a, quite an increased frequency of you using S1 and S2. So on an inlet view, how do you make out uh, that this is the anterior uh, part for S1 and this is the anterior part of S2? I think you're muted, is it? Or I am not able to hear. Can't hear Vivek. You can hear me now? Yeah, okay. we can hear you now. Okay, so yeah. That's a great question. And as I said, and I, I tried to emphasize that was that when you are trying to put in an S2 screw, you need to understand that inlet view may not and may give you false results. So you need to understand a proper inlet view when you are doing in for an S2 screw. We mainly and main, mostly rely on your lateral view, a proper dead lateral view, which is going to give you no obliquity of your S2, a perfect rectangle with sciatic notches overlapped. As I showed, it was a perfect bullseye with no angulation of your guide wire even because that may go in, out, in. So before you start, it has to be a perfect central circle. And once you finish it also, it has to be like that. You look at the outlet view. The two views which you rely on mostly is the outlet and the lateral views for your S2 screws. S1 screw, you can get properly evaluation, but you need to bend and tilt your inlet or the image slightly more, less from the S1 because the plane of the sacrum is getting in a concave sort of a or sort of curve like appearance like this. So for the S1, you want the such an image, but for an S2, you want a more vertical sort where you can see the 
anterior edges of the S2 foramina, which may not be so easy to see in a normal image. You need to have a very good image to see that. Moreover, with your S1 screw already inside with a huge 8.5 millimeter or 8 mm stainless steel out there, it is going to mask your views for your S2 screw. So that's why you just have a look at two or three different images of the inlet, more vertical than the S1 screw, which you want to put in to see whether it is going out or not. But mostly you rely on your lateral views as well as the outlet view to ensure that you are right inside. And I use, as I showed you, I use a drill guide. I do not use K wires for fixing them because drill guides give me a proprioception that I'm always inside and I'm having only three cortices and not beyond that until unless I'm going in for a transsacral screw. So anyone here has used the Dinesh Kale set? There is one small paper uh, which had shown that the in, in the inlet view, your S1 is having an undulated, undulated margin, a wavy margin, W-shaped margin because of the promontory. Whereas in S2, that becomes almost a smooth margin. That is one small hint that we can use when we are doing the inlet view. I think in an inlet view, well, very important is that overlap of S1 and S2 have to be there. And uh, as Dr. Vivek has told, in an S1 screw, I think you can, your tendency is to go towards, not towards the center, but towards the edge of the sacrum so that you have a good purchase. But in S2, you should not be towards the any, either the uh, anterior, not the posterior. It should be in the dead center. That is very important. If you think that you are seeing the S2 border in an inlet view, that means your screw trajectory will be wrong. Your S2 border, anterior border should be inside or, uh, uh, or at the level of S1. That is very important. Yes, let's move with Dr. Pradeep Nemade. And he's going to show us how an open reduction of SI joint can be done and when it is required. Okay, um, so uh, sacral uh, wipe and how? So that's the place where I work, that's KM Hospital. Uh, we know that uh, for sacral joint fixation, we have different methods such as percutaneous sacral ilex screw, just uh, Dr. Tika has spoken about it. Then there's an anti plating. Uh, uh, posterior plating uh, by posterior exposure can also be done or we can use trans plates or uh, trans bars. However, uh, two most common techniques that have been used are the percutaneous SI screw and anterior sacroiliac plating. And all of us uh, almost uh, would agree that percutaneous SI screw is one of the most favored technique uh, in today's era for fixation of uh, the uh, sacroiliac joint. However, anterior sacroiliac plating still have a role and uh, definite indications are there when we would like to go for plating uh, either uh, uh, in uh, addition to the screw or uh, in a substitution to the screw. So um, if we see uh, the literature, there are a few articles. So this is an article which compared the uh, ORIF uh, plus plating uh, versus the percutaneous size screw. And they say there is a no difference that they are noted in their series uh, in between the plating and screw ORIF series. Uh, but they highlighted the fact that there needs to be an algorithm for uh, ORI versus SIRI. Uh, another article which said, uh, uh, where they uh, clinically compared it, then they say that uh, the percutaneous fixation has less injury, less bleeding, less pain, and rapid recovery. And that's why it is one of the most favored uh, treatment for the you know, fixation. Uh, so in that case, the schools are favored. This one article which has compared the front leg the percutaneous plate and a uh, sacroiliac anterior papillinous plate. And they said that the combination of the plate and screw of the papillinous plate and the screw is one of the most uh, 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 biomechanically better fixation uh, than the screw alone. Uh, so this is another uh, study. Uh, there is a percutaneous uh, screw versus anterior plating. And they say that although all fracture healed, uh, there was more intraoperative X -ray, uh, exposure, permanent neurological damage uh, with the screw. So they said that the, uh, the neurological damage, incidence of neurological damage is more with the screw than the plate. Uh, 
uh, another article uh, which uh, biomechanical study which studied the plate versus the screw and they say that uh, the plate have lower stiffness uh, and uh, however they are useful uh, when the screw cannot be performed so screws are still biomechanically much better than plate but when screw cannot be performed the plate are still better uh, another study biomechanically again they have shown that a plate and screw fixation is better so uh, this is for sure now that you know whenever possible we are going to use screw but when it is not possible or when we want to augment the screw fixation we can still use uh, the plating uh, this thing so uh, plate anatomy and biomechanics so if you see the area of good bone is density so uh, on the ilium we have the posterior margin uh, posterior region and the anterior region of the uh, sacro uh, the um, uh, uh, sciatic buttress that are the area where we have good bone purchase we don't have good bone purchase in the middle because that is a very thin plate of bone uh, sacrum we have uh, a good uh, bone trajectory that is just lateral to the foramen so if you see the corner plane screw trajectory the screw trajectory would be just lateral to the bone foramen and parallel to the si joint so we start laterally go angularly slightly medially that is the corner plane and we stay lateral to the sacroiliac uh, the the sacral foramen in a sagittal plane the trajectory is in parallel with the uh, sacrum now this diagram has been uh, widely uh, discussed in uh, in context with the screw where we have um, the different level of the iliac cortical density but this diagram also shows there are different uh, level of pelvic inclination uh, in this patient so this is a very open kind of pelvis and this is very straight kind of pelvis so if you uh, have to you are contemplating uh, the sacral plate again we need to take up lateral view in the beginning uh, so as to know the pelvic inclination of the patient so that you can direct the, the screw according in that trajectory otherwise you will try to go more anterior and more posteriorly and then the screw length will be smaller so a uh, proper lateral x ray and the screw can be used in the same trajectory so if you see the uh, plate one screw trajectory so that is plate one which is more anterior and if it We'll cut the sacrum in that plane and we can see that that is the trajectory uh, that is the cross section that we see and if we measure the length is almost uh, in the region of 50 to 70 so if your screw goes in a right trajectory you will get a screw that is uh, more than 50 and less than 70 that is what is the uh, general experience if you see the plate through such trajectory that is the posterior and the screw is directed posterior superiorly uh, then uh, the the length that you are going to get is almost uh, 25 uh, centimeter 25 millimeters so those two are a little bit smaller than the entire plate and another thing uh, in a uh, anatomy that we need to keep in mind is the l5 nerve root pro uh, proximity so if we see the sacroiliac joint there the l5 nerve root lies almost a centimeter or two lateral to the sacroiliac joint so we definitely cannot put any plate that is medial to the l5 root because that will put a lot of tension to the l5 because if you uh, see during the surgery the hip is flexed so when the hip is flexed then the nerve root kind of tilt you know kind of stretches uh, across the sciatic notch and still it is under tension it will be uh, better in uh, extension of the hip but in the hip flexion it is still under tension and then that's why we cannot go further medially than this point and that's how we can see during the surgery so this is the case which i just did yesterday so this is the sacroiliac joint that's the l5 nerve root so that is how it is close to this sometimes we don't see it because you know with the ligament it get retracted but sometimes when the root is out we can see such beautiful l5 nerve root and it is just around a centimeter or two lateral to the sacroiliac joint so approach we have two approaches for this either we can use lateral window of iliofemoral approach or we can use the iliofemoral approach i tend to use iliofemoral approach for two reasons number one it is very wide it gives a very wide exposure uh, and that is how what is required uh, because you want to get some perspective while temporarily fixing this or you know trying to get the trajectories that is number one number two is uh, trying to go anterior to the sacrum so if you see the iliopectinal fascia that is attached to the uh, the pelvic brim goes posterior and get is continuous with the anterior capsule of the si joint and unless we take out this capsule and facial attachment as a whole we cannot go anterior to the sacrum and going anterior to the sacrum is extremely important when you are uh, planning to do open reduction of SI joint because your clamp placement is on the anterior aspect of the sacrum so as to give that get that 
proper crunch for uh, uh, displacement of the IGM. And for that, uh, I think uh, iliofemoral approach comes very handy because you know we can go much more anterior to the iliopubic eminence and try taking off the fascia. And you suddenly you get a lot of space anterior to the sacrum, which I feel is not that great with the just the lateral window. With the lateral window, you can expose the superior surface of the sacrum. Uh, I am not uh, been uh, in good uh, by exposing uh, the anterior surface of the sacrum with the lateral window. So that's why I prefer iliofemoral approach for plating. So next thing that we need to do is we need to debride the surgeon. We need to open. We need just need to take entire capsular attachment and expose the sacrum subperiosteally there. It's very important to expose it subperiosteally because you know in that case you are not going to go onto the L5 root. You're going to go below, stay below the L5 root, below the capsular periosteal attachment of the sacrum. So uh, it's very important to debride the SI joint because uh, Sometimes we can have a um, small uh, uh, bony fragment. So in this case, you can see uh, iliopemoral approach SI uh, opening. And when we open uh, the joint, a small bony fragment of the nearby iliac fracture was lodging into the SI joint and getting it, uh, reducing the structure by closing is just impossible. So sometimes it is very important to open, reduce uh, the, uh, uh, open the SI joint and uh, do the deprivation, especially so in uh, old cases, uh, to clear out the fibrosis to get proper reduction. So next thing that you need to do is to secure a homan. Uh, so the homan is secured around one, one centimeter, two centimeter medial to the sacral leg joint. You put a small hole with the owl there and just secure the homan just like that. So it is going to protect your null fine owl root while you are going to do your work lateral to this point. Then there are different reduction methods are uh, device uh, are described such as in this where you just manually press the ileum to get compression. You can use shank spin to get this compression or you can use this uh, ferrabrook uh, fera clamp uh, by putting a screw waist clamp to get the compression and reduction across the SI joint. However, uh, these are very uh, true for your uh, open book injuries uh, for a, a vertical shear injury when the sacrum goes, the ileum goes posterior superiorly we need to use this curved mata clamp across the SI joint. So uh, when you open by uh, the iliopemoral approach, you go anterior to the sacrum and put one tine of the clamp anterior to the sacrum and other tine of the clamp onto the ileum uh, or across the ileum uh, uh, by make a small window and go posterior to the ileum. And then we press it, we get the reduction and then we can fix it temporarily with a cable clamp. Or you can use sometimes this curved blend plate. So you take a small plate, bend it to 90 degree secure it to the ileum with one screw, and then you can use this clamp. So one time of the clamp is going anterior to the sacrum. So that's the sacrum, that's the ileum. That is what is the displacement of the ileum. So one time of the clamp goes anterior to the uh, sacrum. Other time is going to go into the bent part of the plate. And when we crunch the clamp, the reduction will come. Then uh, what we need to do is to uh, contour the plate and place it in proper position. So there are two plates, uh, that is the standard description. So this plate number one is goes, uh, the first screw is go the anterior aspect of the sacrum and then two screw along the um, pelvic brim. And the second plate is at 90 degree to that plate and it is bent like that so that you know the screws goes into the, the thickest part of the IM. This screws goes down because that is goes parallel to the SI joint and other screws goes posterior. Uh, uh, it is very difficult sometimes to put a plate try to get the entry point and try to drill it into the sacrum because uh, drilling the first uh, the first hole of uh, the the screw hole of the uh, first plate is one of the most tricky issue in the sacroiliac plate because you have a lot of trunk pressure there because that is uh, the the drill trajectory really goes into the um, uh, the corner of the incision uh, so we use very long sleeve uh, we put it there and then we drill it first. So we put a plate, mark the area of the screw temporary with a pottery, then uh, drill the screw uh, freehand, and then we uh, try to, uh, you know, uh, try to put these screws. And then we put the screw, we measure the screw, and then we put the plate and screw together so as our job becomes much more easier. So uh, there are a few cases. Now, this is the case. Now, Dr. Tika spoke about sacral dysplasia. And sometimes we can have, uh, uh, sorry, uh, my, I missed this slide. So my, my indication for SI plating uh, today are sacral dysplasia. Sometimes we can have poor imaging for iliosacral screw. So 
pileocycles you you know that you know you need to have a very good imaging in case you have poor imaging for uh, because of the gases or poor cm quality in that case uh, we have to uh, resort to plating and once in my life i have to do this just because of poor imaging i have to abandon idocycles to and resort to the plating sometimes we have a more bad moral level lesion at the entry point of the idocycle screw and uh, you know that can be a relative indication uh, to abandon it and do a plating a uh, crescent fracture uh, day type 1 or day type 2 can be the indication for uh, the uh, sacroiliac plating uh, one is definite indication and two is a relative indication uh, nowadays i would like to treat all my uh, day type 2 fracture by idocycle plating i'll show few cases in support of that sometimes the plate can be used in supplement to the si screw uh, or sometimes we are doing a combined pelvicular blow injury for which open approach is already done and um, uh, you don't want to put uh, uh, the cm into multiple position just because you know you are more uh, um, serious issue down at the acetabular level so in that case we can just resort down to the plating so this is the first case uh, this is one of the case where we have sacral dysplasia dr tikha spoke about it and in the case of sacral dysplasia uh, putting the iliosacral screw becomes very difficult and it was compounded the fact of because of poor imaging here uh, the cm quality was not that good and in that case i had to resort to plating and that's how uh, uh, the plate number 1 again the screw trajectory is parallel uh, the it remains lateral to the sacral foramina and parallel to the si joint it goes down like that and the plate number 2 the screw goes posteriorly like that and then uh, that's how it is fixed another case we can see that there is a sacral dysplasia here a bilateral si opening with sw fracture on one side uh, again uh, uh, we can and this was old so we reduced it first open reduction because of the by ideal approach put a small plate and then we uh, throw in one or uh, two screws on either side and rest of the fracture was also fixed with multiple screws uh, now combined pelvic cerebral injury again is uh, 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 sacral dysplasia we can appreciate how much vertical alar slope is there so putting a screw in this s1 is very very difficult even if we put it can be a, it will be a very small uh, screw and again we have to open again for this acetabular of fracture so in that case again we reduce it open it reduce it uh, uh, by a curve mata clamp and fixed a plate a posterior plate we put use plate number 2 we didn't use plate number 1 because then we pass a screw in the s2 so this is a combination of sacroiliac plate plus sacroiliac screw so we are passing a screw in s2 and uh, we are passing a plate because of the sacral dysplasia we use plate at the level of the s1 and then the rest of the screw was a fixation was done by a percutaneous acetabular screw Uh, now day type 2 crescent fracture so sometimes we have fracture like this now the traditional treatment for this fracture is prone position plating uh, lc2 screws uh, and maybe a, a screw uh, as iliosacral screw to the plate however uh, it requires two approaches because when we need to do it in prone and again we need to come make it supine and fix this fracture in supine position i want to fix it in one position so i can do it by the a uh, supine position uh, only uh, open it and put a sacroiliac plate here uh, so that it neutralizes your sacroiliac joint so this uh, uh, plate this plate uh, sacroiliac plate neutralizes the sacroiliac joint i have passed another t plate out of which one screw is going on the present fragment other in the normal so in that way we are uh, neutralizing that fragment also we take a small incision uh, on the lateral aspect and we slide a three hole plate and through that middle hole of that plate we can just pass a screw so that the the plate acts like a big washer and does not cut through into the fracture site so that is the way by which lc2 fracture also can be managed by combination of uh, the sacroiliac fixation by plating as well as the screw and in the same setting we can go ahead and fix the anterior uh, fixation as well so that uh, is the uh, ad, uh, benefit of this technique Uh, another case of uh, type 2 crescent fracture and again we open put a curved mata clamp and reduce it with three plates one two and three third for the crescent fragment and that's how crescent 2 can be managed sometimes we have combined pelvic acetabular injury it's a elderly gentleman uh, like this again a crescent fracture and we can fix it again in the same since approach has already been done we can fix it uh, with uh, the sacroiliac plate posterior by acetabular fixation we can do the same thing uh, by a stop approach and release so everything can be done uh, in a smaller incision and smaller uh, you know surgical footprint 
Uh, sometimes we have combined an exposure already done. Now this fracture can very well be managed by uh, by the uh, allo sector screw as well. But since uh, everything is already been done, we also added one plate and in addition to the two screws just to enhance the fixation of this thing. So this is the SW injury was managed. It was fixed again with two SI screw, but in addition, uh, we have added one uh, SI plate just to add uh, to the fixation. And that's the post of X. So take home messages. Uh, currently, ILO sacral screw is one of the most favored fixation of SI joint, no doubt about that. However, plating has still definite indications and hence needs to be mastered. I favor ILO femoral approach than lateral window because it gives me better exposure and better uh, access to the entire part of the sacrum. L5 now root should be respected and sacral screw of the plate one is most crucial and trajectory of uh, that should be mastered uh, for the successful uh, uh, execution of sacral left plate. Thank you. That was again a very nice talk. Uh, there was a question related to crescent fractures, and I think it has been very well addressed in this talk. So let's move to Dr. Ashok Raju, who is going to talk to us about lumbopelvic or triangular fixation. Thank you, Dr. Nimade. Uh, uh, very good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity. I'll be speaking about how and why we do a lumbopelvic fixation or a, a triangular fixation. Uh, there's a subgroup of uh, sacral fractures uh, which are associated with uh, a term called as spinopelvic dissociation. There is not much uh, understanding as to what this actually means. It means that when the spine and upper central segment of the sacrum is, uh, has no continuity with the remaining part of the caudal sacrum and the pelvis, remaining sac uh, pelvis, is what is called as spinopelvic dissociation. It can be unilateral or bilateral. Based on the different classification systems, you can find the spinopelvic dissociation in Dennis zone two and three. According to Euler's classification of the zone two of Dennis, you can see that a fracture line which is exiting through the L5-S1 facetal joint or medial to it, it leads into the spinopelvic instability. And this is the fractures where you find the avulsion injuries of the lumbosacral plexus. You have the uh, uh, bilateral sacral fractures, that is the U-type and the H-type. These are the kind of fractures where you have the whole of the appendicular system is totally dissociated with the axial system. It is the Roy Camelli classification, which talks about the transverse fractures of the sacrum. Here you can have uh, displaced or partially displaced fractures. It is in these fracture patterns that is the displaced and the partially displaced fracture. You can have transection of the sacral nerve roots or the lower sacral cord. So based on these fractures, again, the level of the transection, whether the injury is below the SI joint, that means you are unlikely to have uh, bladder uh, and bowel incontinence. And if the injury is above or at the level of S1, S2, then you are likely to have a bowel bladder uh, incontinence leading to poor prognosis. So these spinopelvic dissociation injuries in the sacrum are highly unstable injuries. And the goal of the treatment should be to get an alignment between the ileum, sacrum, and the spine. And this could be achieved by uh, achieving a stability through a spinopelvic fixation where the translational and rotational forces are counterbalanced both in vertical and horizontal directions. And if you have a, a neurological uh, injury, you should think about decompressing it either directly or indirectly by either fracture, curate a fracture reduction or through by a sacral uh, laminectomy respectively. Uh, there are two types of fixation uh, orientation of fixations. One, like in the tension band plate or the SI screw, which are horizontally oriented fixation, and the lumbopelvic fixation, which is oriented vertically. A combination of these two is what is called as a triangular fixation. It gives maximum stability both vertically and horizontally. What happens is that 
through a triangular fixation, the load gets transferred from the ilium directly into the spine, thereby offloading the injured part of the sacrum and helps helping in fracture healing. There are multiple studies which have shown different methods of fixation of sacrum, and it has been shown that the triangular fixation has the superior axial uh, stiffness, and hence, because of this, it has maximum stability and leads into lesser uh, interfragment movement and creating an uh, environment for better fracture healing. Now, coming to management, most important thing is that you have to evaluate him. He should be hemodynamically stable when you're planning for it and look for a lesion like this, which is a degloving injury. And these are contraindications for doing a lumbar pelvic fixation or triangular fixation. You do an inlet view and an outlet view. You have uh, to evaluate radio drive, then get a, a CT scan done. CT scan done helps us to understand the morphology of the fracture pattern of the sacrum. And not only that, you have to look into factors like whether the pedicle of L5 is intact or not, especially when you have a huge transverse fracture, which is uh, more medially placed where you, the fracture can extend into L5. And that is the cases where you have to think about putting your pedicle screw into L4. Look for sacral dysmorphism. That is very important. That is based on, on, based on the sacral dysmorphism. You try to put your uh, 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 SI screws. Look for combination, whether to use a fully threaded or partially threaded screw. And look for intraforaminal bone fragments. These are the cases where you have to think about doing a a, a laminectomy or a foronotomy. The operative technique, the, the, the procedure is done in a prone position. Uh, you have to look that uh, when you're putting in a prone position, the ASI should be free. It should not uh, hitch on to your uh, supports, the lateral supports. Otherwise, it will prevent the hyperextension of the, uh, your reduction technique of hyperextension of the pelvis. You can also put a, a distal femoral pin for longitudinal traction. The draping should be whole of the lumbar spine till the natal cleft and the side where you want to put the, the SI screws, I think that should be also be free. The approach is a midline approach. Your incision is from L3 to S3 level. You subperiostally elevate the whole of your muscle in the proximal segment, your lat uh, lateral uh, transverse process should be seen of L5 and S1. And in the lower part, in the sacral region, the whole of the dorsum of the sacrum, the posterior superior leg spine, posterior inferior leg spine, and a part of the sciatic nose should be at least visible. So your reduction technique uh, should be your uh, vertical migration is by traction. Your flexion is by hyperextension of pelvis and hip. Your external rotation is by internally rotating the hip and your medial lateral translation is by either a, a ball spike or a reduction clamp. Once you have achieved a reduction, that is when you put your uh, pedicle screws, then you can put your ileal screws, but don't connect it. You have to do a iliosacral screw fixation through a, 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 a SI screw as described, and then you connect your pedicle screws with your uh, ileal screw. That is how your reduction and fixation should be. Coming to uh, SI screw fixation, it has been already been talked. Most of the time, these are sacral transfer uh, fractures. So your screw direction should be perpendicular to the fracture and the landmarks are same as SI joint fixation. Whether you use partially threaded or fully threaded is up to you. Pedicle screw fixation, the most important point is that you should preserve the joint capsule of the facetal joint, whether it is L4, L5, or L5, S1, wherever possible. Coming to the ileal screw, the direction of the ileal screw is very important. Your entry point is anterior below the posterior superior iliac spine. This helps in uh, countersinking the head and it prevents irritation of the wound. Now, once you have made an entry point, you drill in a direction anteriorly, laterally, and inferiorly towards the anterior inferior iliac spine. The screw uh, is goes, uh, it takes its own way between the outer table and the inner table, and the screw length should be around 80 to 100 millimeters. The reason that, that uh, because 
It has a bicortical contact at around three to four centimeters from PSIs and at around seven to eight centimeters from the posterior superior iliac spine. This single screw, when it is longer in length, has more pullout strength. So you have to check your screw position while you're doing the ileal screw. Look into the iliac view to see that the direct, so it points toward the anterior inferior iliac spine. And the second, it is about the sciatic notch in an iliac view. In an operator view, especially in an operator outlet view, you should see that your pedicle screw is within the teardrop. These are the most important uh, images while putting the ileal screw. Now then, once you have reduced, you have fixed your uh, sacrum with a SI screw and you connect your uh, pedicles with the ileal screw with a connecting rod in a neutral mode. Now coming to nerve decompression, wherever there is a nerve injury, there, uh, you can do a decompression either indirectly through fracture reduction or directly by doing a sacral uh, lam laminotomy. Which is better? Even, even now, the literature, there is no clear-cut consensus which gives better result. Uh, Schuldier has shown that when they have, they have done a, a sacral laminotomy, laminectomy, in most, almost all the cases of the sacrum where they had neural injury, they found there is no improvement in the neurological recovery. So they have recommended that accurate reduction of the sacral fracture is the most important for nerve decompression. Whereas Zele has done a comparative study of to know uh, uh, a nerve injury where recovery of the nerve injury where they have done a, a, a indirect reduction as well as uh, direct uh, decompression. And they found that, that when they do a sacral laminectomy, they found better uh, functional outcomes than when they don't do it. So the controversy exists. So the, uh, the, this algorithm gives an idea when to do a, uh, when, uh, lab, uh, when it can, surgical decompression can be done. So when you have a completely displaced fracture and you have a cauda equina syndrome or a complete nerve injury, I think you can think about doing a wide decompression. When you have a sacral foramen uh, stenosis, especially in your lateral view, again, you can think about doing a decompression and this decompression can be a focal or a wide decompression. Post-operatively, I think it is a best fixation. It has got maximum stability. So you can start, if the other injuries permit you, I think you can do a partial weight bearing uh, for the first six weeks, then followed by full weight bearing at uh, the second six weeks. By end of three months, they are fully weight bearing and the fracture generally heals by 10 to 12 weeks but it's recommended that you have to remove the implants, especially the lumbosacral implants by end of six to 12 months. What are the complications? Most of the time, especially in thin patients, when you don't bury your screws properly, you, they'll have a feeling of painful implants. There can be wound complications, which is generally seen in these injuries because most of the sacral, these are high energy injuries and they have some amount of soft tissue injury, even in the posterior aspect. There are cases where they have reported loosening of the implants, and most of the time it is the iliosacral screw which gets loosened up or it's broken. They have also reported uh, a frac uh, loosening of the lumbosacral screw, but the incidence is comparatively less. The complication of lumbosacral scoliosis is known. It is in these cases because you use the pedicle screws to reduce your fracture, and that is when this complication arrives. So you should not use the pedicle screws for your reduction technique. It is only for stabilization in a neutral position. So in conclusion, sacral fractures with spinopelvic dissociation have a high, are highly unstable fractures and a high incidence of neurological deficit. Management of these fractures involves restoring the pelvis with the spine and achieving stability with triangular fixation. Triangular fixation provides uh, good stability prevents secondary displacements, and you can have a good fracture union at an early weight bearing. The so best suited for sacral fractures with spinal pelvic dissociation. 
you can consider laminotomy sacral laminotomy when you have a sacral uh, when you have a neurological involvement especially when you have a complete fracture with a displacement or when you have a sacral canal stenosis the most important point is the accurate reduction of the sacral fracture which is probably the most important uh, part of the surgical procedure for indirect not only for indirect uh, nerve decompression but also to have the best clinical outcomes so these are some of the cases this is a case of uh, lateral uh, zone 2 injury extending into medial aspect of the uh, uh, facetal joint so and not only that he had neurological uh, injury and uh, he had a foot drop neurological deficit so we have done an anterior fixation followed by the ilial screws and the lumbosacral fixation this is the second case most it looks more likely to be a zone 2 injury but if you look at the lateral part of the sacrum they extend in a coronal view the fracture is extending from the inferior aspect to the superior aspect in a antero posterior direction so these are cases of unstable injury so we have done a anterior fixation followed by a, a, a fixation of the lumbosacral with a si screw this is the other case where the fracture is exiting through the center zone 3 injury but there is dislocation of both in the uh, facetal joint this was pretty unstable and she also had a, a open or a, a vault tear a vaginal tear so we went ahead once she was stable we went ahead and did a, a sacral uh, si screw fixation with the uh, ilio uh, uh, lumb uh, ilio lumbar fixation we didn't do the anterior fixation because of the uh, vault tear so we had a good reduction and the patient recovered from the neurological deficit she had there is a other case where she had a polytrauma it's a bad injury both the facets are gone and uh, pretty unstable she went into ARDS we had fixed the uh, femur and the tibia and the humerus she had a chest injury so we it was a delayed fixation so we went ahead and did a fixation of the lumbopelvic fixation i was not comfortable in doing a si screw because i was not very sure whether i was having a good reduction of the sacrum so i didn't put a, a si screw in this case this is other case which is a late presentation or almost like a non union where uh, the with a, a neurological uh, deficit so we had done an anterior fixation followed by a posterior fixation instead of si screw because my reduction of the uh, sacrum is not great so we have used a tension band and stabilized it uh, within the lumbosacral fixation this went ahead to have a good union and he had a recovery of the uh, no, foot drop thank you thank you dr ashok for a very nice uh, detailed talk on the technique and also on the indications uh, we now move to dr ramesh sen ramesh sen sir has been the uh, first president of our aopas founder president and dr ramesh sen has we all know has extensive experience so now these are words of wisdom complications in pelvic trauma and i think this is going to be very important for all of us to listen thank you pranab uh, i hope my slides is visible yes sir they are visible okay as has been stated right from the first talk that the problem in pelvic fracture the complication start from the time when the fracture happens which can lead to a situation of the patient when he can land up in an extreme situation or he could be somewhere intermediate or it could be a stable and we might have a situation of a unstable patient having a unstable pelvis now what is that unstable pelvis doing it can increase the risk of mortality then and if that patient happens to be elderly or if patient happens to be in shock also the chances of mortality tends to increase it does differ in between fracture patterns also as per this paper if we look at it the age the amount of injury sustained the blood pressure and if you look at the graph down there this incidence of mortality keeps on increasing as the injury increases and likewise as many associated injuries happen whether it is the head vis a vis non head injury and the head injury there is a significant increase in mortality in these situations and what are these associated injuries they could be in the skeletal system they could be in the head and chest 
it could be in the abdominal and neurovascular generatory degrowing injuries all these associated injuries will require simultaneous and in some cases subsequent care this is from our own uh, paper where we have found it out that among 112 pelvic fracture patients urological injury was in 27% abdominal in about 10% and going down lower limb injuries in 11% and chest trauma in about 8% so they are reasonably common injuries within this pelvic fracture pattern and they need appropriate care at the time and simultaneously when we are treating the pelvic fracture as such whether it is a bladder injury or whether it is a urethral injuries what is more important in these injuries is that apart from that care these patients are likely to continue with the care of the urinary bladder for a very long time even when the fractures have healed the fractures automatically takes a reasonable number of weeks rather months but this urinary bladder uh, this urethral injuries can take even longer in these patients in females as we publish that the urethra is small but still they can have a lot many problem in a pelvic fracture situation where the reduction of displaced fragment is very important in these cases also and these patients the ladies can land up in a vaginal stenosis or recurrent urethral vaginal fistula is a complication of the pelvic trauma affecting the genital injuries then pregnancy if there is a pregnancy and the pelvic trauma happens there is a very high rate of cesarean section somewhere around 70% and that is a very important situation in this complication happen then there is a degloving we will have another separate lecture on that but this is again one of the situations which complicates the pelvic fractures and their management subsequently in many cases it may be apparent on the day one but in many of the cases it is not seen for first 3 4 days and by the time it is seen we are technically late in management of these cases very open now a very big problem is that if these fractures getting open now if this opening happens depending on the area how far away it is from the perineal area from the anal area the chances of complications are very high now there is an uh, access to the exterior for all the hematoma to happen and with all those factors if you look at the mortality of a standard pelvic fracture it is about 5 to 20% but if it is an open pelvic fracture the mortality goes as high as 50% so these are the really the most important emergencies which need to be taken care of and why this is happening to be highly mortality because most of these injuries which land up in an open fracture are unstable they will have a lot of bleeding due to their significant severity they may have a lot of vessel disruption there is no tamponade and because they will need a lot of blood there could be coagulopathy and now the fracture being open more contamination and rectal involvement more septic issues can develop in these patients and what is to be done definitely wound management along with whatever the pelvic uh, management is to be done we need to leave the wound open we need to we might have to go for a second dog surgery and in a specific cases wherever it's around medial area we have to do a diverting colostomy and along with this aggressive antibiotic therapy so that the all open area can be converted into a in spite of all these efforts this is a patient with us who had this kind of an open injury and we try to take out the ileum which was totally exposed you can see in this x ray reasonable part of ileum was broken there was a little continuity left which was a compromise for us to leave that part of it she landed up and she stayed with this kind of a complication throughout her life subsequently she is going with that kind of a situation but that the worst complication which can have in this kind of a situation another very important perspective is thromboembolism rather contrary to the thinking that it's not common in our population it is a very important issue and i always show this x ray which and the record of this patient where the kind of a injury the pelvic trauma where we did a fixator it was a degloving could not really give much of the uh, blood thinner in that situation we had the mortality coming on the fourth day of the surgery and we had attended that 
looking at that perspective, we did a subsequent analysis of this pelvic vestibular trauma and looked at whether it is how common it is. And what we found that 10 out of the 50 patients had asymptomatic pulmonary embolism when we tested on the pulmonary angiography. And that is a very important perspective. 50 patients and 10 out of them getting asymptomatic pulmonary embolism. Now, the question is what that asymptomatic will do. If we look at the literature, there is a very high mortality rate in these patients with asymptomatic and one out of 10 definitely will be losing that patient. So, we have to be very careful about prophylaxis. And that it's not always that we are talking about very high kind of a costly things. It is basically physical measures right from the day one. Intermittent pneumatic compression, all those simple physical things. And we can have a kind of a heparin, we can give warfarin, depending upon case to case basis. But this is a very important perspective right from the day of injury when we think that the bleeding might have stopped we must start taking care of the limbs, depending on the stability of the pelvis also. And subsequently, when the patient is waiting for a definitive surgery also, we have to be very careful about prevention. Because if we have already got this formation, we might need much more than that, just like this patient who during a period has developed it and subsequently we have to put a filter and then we have to operate upon this patient. We already have a lecture on these neurological injuries where the cause of neurological involvement in pelvic could be a compression injury. But many a time in a vertical fracture, they are more like a shearing or a stretch injuries also. Now, depending on those pattern of injuries, if there is a compression, as was said in the previous talk, we may need to decompress them. But if it is a traction injury, they may not respond. And another thing which was talked in the previous lecture was a kind of a involvement which could happen in the back, in the segment area, it could happen in the whole of the leg as a U pattern, it can happen in the lateral side of the leg, or it could happen in the foot also, depending on the kind of a injury it is. And as was said again, that it is the decompression, which could be by indirect reduction. This was a child about 15 years back when he came, he had this deformity, inability to stretch it out. So, and you can see the kind of a deformity he had. We did an indirect kind of a reduction at that stage. And automatically within two or three months, the neurological recovery also started in this kind of a situation. So it could be a simple phenomenon of a neuropraxia, which might have happened and which might have recovered. Another important part is a major vessel injury. Now there could be a transection of the vessel leading to a kind of a total blockage, or it could be an occlusive injury causing an ischemia with its telltale sign, which we can identify. And it's very important to perceive that a good external appearance doesn't mean. Now, you can look at this patient, even with the clinical examination, we might not perceive, even with the x-rays may look deceptive, but when you look at the CT and the CT angiography, this is a ghastly injury affecting whole neurovascular status of the total limb. And many of these patients are likely to end up in hemipelvic because they tend to have the total involvement, which can never be salvaged and end up with a kind of this outcome. One of the ways in which we have tried is this is one another case where there was a vascular injury and in its management rather than opening in that area because the collaterals have already developed, we just put an X fix, we reduced that fracture, we stabilized with percutaneous screws into the LC2 corridors and that way we could stabilize. I mean, we need to search for some alternatives in this kind of a complications. Now, Actually, if we are not operating on these patients in time, what is happening? If you look at this uh, from the records, gait abnormality, limb and discrepancy, backache, and not many changes from which has already been enumerated in the first talk also, not many things can happen. But is that problem of a position really giving us a problem? Now, this is a 24 years female who had a significant injury, probably at the time, some fat embolism developed. This injury was not taken care of it. But if you look here, the posterior side and anterior side, anterior side injury is much more than the posterior side. So even after two years of the injury, in spite of the big anterior gap, she does not have any clinical problem in her abilities. So it's very important to perceive which inability is giving another patient with a sacral non-union. Now there's a significant problem 
pelvis is mal position now this patient can sit can squat but when you really look on a proper pelvic scoring assessment you find it out she is not perfect now that's a one important point our patients many of them tend to accept the inabilities as a part of the injury process which they may not be giving a problem as far as pain is concerned they, they many time they accept those disabilities and here again there is a young boy 20 years where there is a mal positioning and a union posteriorly and anteriorly but he is able to execute his job so he is not unhappy with it but that does not happen with everyone now here is another patient another child with a significant displacement and the inability you can see he cannot sit properly he cannot stand properly and he has got a significant limb length discrepancy now this is important because initially people used to have traction as a treatment now if this is again we have published that if we just give a non operative care we definitely do reduction and the left side you see the blue are the initial displacement and we have looked out all these uh, cases when you attempt a traction reduction you are able to reduce them to a reasonable extent but you have never been able to reduce them to less than a centimeter of displacement while if you do a operative care almost you can always bring them to anatomical or within less than a centimeter or less than half a centimeter of the normal position so the conservative management can stabilize but the residual displacement is likely to stay while surgery will bring it to always into a best possible care now how this small displacement will actually matter as i have told it in the earlier period also that some of the patients may be comfortable again what we have observed and published is that if that displacement is less than a centimeter patient does not have a problem 1 to 2 cm if you look at the number of cases with the problem with their smfa grade they are likely to be affected and if there is a severe displacement their smfa grade the quality of life is significantly suffering so that is the basic problem that if the displacement is not corrected it's very important another thing which we have seen and published is that if you compare a sacroiliac joint disruption and a displacement with a sacrum fracture because the sacrum fracture many a time mal unite and the patient doesn't remain in a problem but a sacroiliac dislocation neglected remains as a painful area and the patients remain more often symptomatic in this kind of a situation so that is uh, to say that sacroiliac disruptions are worse than the sacrum fracture which are unmanaged now injury may not be very big but that can be painful here you can see you even don't realize there is a fracture in the uh, area it starts manifesting subsequently with the movement of the patients and it develops a kind of a pseudoarthrosis over that area which eventually settled with the proper application of the pelvic binder at one stage but many cases do not settle down here you see there is a non union of the ischium over here and he had a significant problem in of the pain whenever he was sitting on this side of it so such a small problem was also significant for him then you see here the ilium it looks to be non significant it doesn't be weight bearing but if you know that all hip abductors the significant part is attached to this fragment so this was a 68 year old lady with 6 month old injury she was not able to walk due to this abductor mechanism not helping her and once it is a non union it's a fresh fracture it is very comfortable to treat once it was a non union to make it stable i had to put lot of many plates from up to down only then it healed subsequently and you can see the number of plates i told because every time i was assessing the stability it was still poor with the long thin plate in this kind of a situation now here is another issue of the lack of posterior stability the anterior reduction was done but posterior was not stabilized now this patient is not able to even stand with the without uh, support and what we did was we just went posteriorly put this transilic plates and he was able to comfortably manage himself with this surgery done on the either side for this transilic plating another patient with almost the similar kind of a situation where the posterior non union was giving him a problem he found it difficult without a support to walk around and we just did it we supported posteriorly with the two plates and he was comfortable and able to stabilize himself in this kind of a situation another problem in a younger patient could be this neglected 
vertical displacement, which this patient was not very happy due to limb lengthening. You can see it out here that he has a curvature over here and it is with this, uh, the shoe wear he was able to correct. So he wanted this correction. So we went on to create that osteotomy in the posterior part of it. We, we could not really make it totally, but it was much better than the initial displacement which he has got and he was quite happy with this introduction. There is another boy which came with a very significantly rotated hemipelvis over there and he was not able to sit, he was not able to stand, his movements were also restricted due to the abnormal position. So what we went, we went, we released them, we brought it down to make it more straight, more appropriate and eventually he was able to have from this position to have better positioning of ability to stand, ability to walk around, and his limb length was also, we try to reduce it in this way, by little displacement at that level. Now, there could be other issues also, that if that ischium, now here there is a patient where the ischium was actually protruding into the rectum, so the gen surgeon asked us to take out that part of the ischium from this area because it was protruding into the ischium, so that was done. Then, as was said again in the first talk was about this, uh, problem in the sex. In this patient, he had a coccygodemia as a fracture of this uh, sacral coccygeal area and was giving him symptomatic. And another patient, a female who had this non-union uh, also complained of dyspareunia, which subsequently settled once this surgery was done for her. Now, can we do about this surgery in these cases? Again, doing a non-union and a malunion is a very tricky situation. There are very serious surgeries which have got a problem in management problem. So it is only done when the patient has got a disabling pelvic pain, when we are clear about the instability as a cause, and when it correlates to that union. We have highlighted in our publication also, and it's very well in the other publication also, that we have to be very careful. The world literature about correction of uh, this non-union malunion is relatively limited in one of the um, uh, editorials we have published it out that it can be done, but we must appreciate this surgery is complex, takes a lot of time, blood loss is there, and complication rate is reasonably high. Now, what are the problems which can happen in our management itself? Again, if we are doing this thing, our these scars are likely to stay around with all those wounds, and so that is one area where we have to be careful about. Then even if this C-clamp, if they are not appropriately placed, which were done in an acute kind of a situation, they can go into the wrong place like here and definitely, or they can increase the compression across the sacrum also if it is causing that kind of a, and it can lead to a neurological compression. We know that many a time our plates, if they are not adequate enough, they do fail at the symphysial joint, and especially if the posterior stability has not been achieved, alone anterior fixation tends to fail. And this is one of my very first cases which we had while I was trying to reduce this fracture with the posterior plate fixation. This is one problem which can happen in this kind of a situation where this failed and she eventually settled down, but then it took little time for her to settle down with this kind of a fixation. Because when we are going posteriorly, if you're not careful about our these things, skin incisions, we can have that kind of issue. So concluding all these things, we tend to see that pelvic injury pattern has got a complication right from its happening to subsequent management also. And the most important are the associated injuries which can give a problem. There could be complications due to inadequate management. There could be complications into the def after the definitive management. So if we are aware of all those complications, our steps must start right from the initial care till the final management of these injuries. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So as we all know now, sir has very clearly highlighted that the operative treatment of displaced and unstable pelvic fractures will definitely give much better outcome provided the surgery is done with a proper technique. Now we come to the last uh, talk of today and that is by Dr. Abhay Elhams on one very important point. Almost every speaker has highlighted this moral level lesion. So I think uh, it deserves to be uh, a detailed uh, uh, and Dr. Abhay is going to do it for us. Am I audible? And is my screen visible? Yes, you are audible and the screen is also visible. Thank you, Pranav. And thank you, Indian Orthopedic Association, uh, for giving me this opportunity. My brief today is to talk about 
a soft tissue problem uh, a moral level lesion which has a huge implication in the management of uh, pelvic trauma and even other uh, associated skeletal trauma so if i have to explain what a moral level lesion would be i would rather say that let us assume that the elephant which is a pelvic injury for a patient has gone through the door has to walk in through a gateway to reach complete recovery so if the elephant has walked through the door and if only his tail is left behind that tail would be the moral level lesion so if you don't let it pass smoothly it will create all kinds of havoc and the elephant finally will not be able to reach the contralateral side or the opposite or door so we start with a patient a young adult male as rakesh mentioned these are all breadwinners of the family male patients road traffic accidents had a gcs which was fair had presented with pain deformity and open wounds and fractures of the right forearm fractures in the right thigh bones and in the leg and had moral level lesion also which was extending from the thigh to the uh, gluteal region this patient had an open 3b uh, wedge fracture of the tibia had a 3a segmental fracture of the femur he had a both bone fracture of the forearm and had an apc injury of the pelvis as you see on these pre operative x rays that were done once the patient was uh, stabilized hemodynamically and reported to the ed or the emergency department of the hospital so the basic question that one has to ask is how do you triage the management of, of the patient and you triage the management of the injuries so you have to deal with a, a closed fracture of the pelvis which is an ap c2 injury uh, open segmental femur which is a grade 3a injury uh, 3b uh, ipsilateral tibia and a grade 2 both bone forearm and to top it all there is a moral levelly a small moral levelly lesion so the basic question one has to ask them is what is the order of stabilization what is the method of fixation and what takes priority uh, or soft tissue management and the three principal techniques or thought processes or philosophies that one can use to deal with this particular situation is either do a damage control early total care or let the patient stabilize to uh, biochemically certain parameters and do an early appropriate op early appropriate care or manage the patient uh, the life uh, manage the life of the patient first and do a damage control wherein you do uh, a subsequent definitive management later on so what is important to understand here is that with a moral level lesion etc and ec get thrown out of the window and the patient distinctly goes into damage control orthopedics which means that the soft tissue injury or the moral level lesion has to take precedence over and over any definitive bony management the open bone long bone injuries and the pelvic injuries have to be managed at the same time simultaneously so as the patient is stabilized hemodynamically and subsequently one can look at the concept of stabilizing and giving the patient function back subsequently so day 0 was essentially doing a, 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 a aggressive debrimer of the moral level wound and stabilizing the bony injuries with external fixators putting a whack on the moral level wounds and debriding and providing external fixation to the limbs this unfortunate unfortunately my plastic surgeon did have the a uh, flap of this particular patient so he just passed on a flap of the same region which is a local advancement flap or the keystone flap uh, which he uses for similar situations but smaller wounds and then on once the flap was the flap was done on day 14 uh, um, after the debrima on day 0 the patient goes into uh, uh, stabilization of definitive stabilization of the other injuries so uh, around 3 weeks he goes in for the stabilization of the uh, pelvis the posterior pelvic ring and the anterior pelvic ring and the fixation of the forearm and once you have the 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 moral level which has healed adequately 
you go in for subsequent uh, fixation definitive fixation of the femur and gradually down the line definitive fixation of the tibia so basically understanding that once you have a moral level lesion or a major soft tissue lesion which can compromise the quality of fixation that one can give for the patient then the philosophy of care essentially just shifts from etc or an esc to a damage control orthopedics and that is very very important to understand when we are placed with some similar situations in poly traumatized patients so the learning outcome here would be what is what are the caveats associated with a moral level lesion or an internal degloving injury or a a post traumatic seroma identifying certain risk factors and talking about the physiologic mechanisms which go into this injury certain treatment options that are available with us and what are the surgical considerations that we have to keep in mind so the internal degloving essentially it's a soft tissue internal degloving which is usually resultant and seen with high energy trauma patients it is secondary to a tangential shearing force which occurs in these patients and what is important is that the extent of internal injury may be much more than what is visible outside so never never disregard the uh, uh, severity of a moral level lesion so it is a lesion which has to be uh, correctly assessed it is a lesion which has to be correctly evaluated and it is a lesion which if not put into the correct perspective of treatment will cause a problem and will not allow us to give a satisfactory result to our patient was first described in 1853 as a proximal thigh lesion in a patient who fell off a moving train by a, a french scientist but was put into perspective again 100 years later by none other than letolin and judet who described the similar lesions in acetabular fractures which we all understand are very high energy trauma so the moral level classically that we see is mostly associated with greater trochanter and that is where these lesions are present in our pelvic or a combined pelvic acetabular injury patients or polytrauma patients then comes uh, the thigh lesions the gluteus and the pelvis lesions and then the lesions can happen anywhere in the body including the knee the lumbosacral region the abdomen the calf or the head but it is the greater trochanter and the thigh region which and the pelvis region which essentially contribute to about 70% of moral level lesions that one can see in different poly trauma scenarios so it is something that is very very important to register it is something which is very important to actively seek out in high energy traumas and it is simple something that is very important to understand that this injury is more than what it seems in our faces so what is the incidence of these injuries so various literatures have uh, published different kinds of things and the actual incidence for different authors which has been described by various authors varies from 0.7 to 12.5% but the problem is that almost 33% of these patients will have a diagnostic delay sometimes even non recognition of the moral level lesion as important and this delay can vary from hours to days to even months and to non recognition which brings us to the correct statement of incidence which is that the true incidence of a moral level lesion is not exactly known similar injuries have been quoted by various authors as having different incidences as mentioned in the slide the variability in detection of the incidence essentially uh, is because significant proportion of these lesions go undetected or are detected late because we do not suspect that a relatively innocuous looking lesion on the skin may have such a major involvement of internal subcutaneous soft tissue the important thing to understand is what is the mechanism so once there is a tangential shear force uh, uh, of a high energy trauma whether it is a motor vehicle accident or a fall from height or a or a two or a motorcycle accident essentially what happens as a as a starting point is an abrupt separation of the dermis from the underlying fascia 
and then into this the traversing vessels of the dermis they bleed in and there is a collection of blood fat and debris and this essentially starts to form a cavity which is lined by mesothelium and therein you have a lymph collecting inside this more level lesion and which is why these lesions will not uh, they clog this vessel and once the capsule is formed or the pseudo capsule is formed it is like a pseudo cyst which will not go away and if this cyst is huge or large then it has to be surgically uh, decompressed otherwise uh, the mesothelium will not allow the 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 fluid inside the cyst to disappear as easily as a hematoma might resolve so the evolution in expansion of lesion happens and then there is a sustained inflammatory reaction leading to a fibrous capsule and a pseudo cyst formation that is a, a pictorial demonstration of what happens and what is important to understand in the light of the previous picture is that secondary risk factors become important in certain situations for example the female gender it has been variously quoted that the fat distribution in women essentially contributes to them having a higher risk but we all understand that pelvic lesions are seen predominantly in the third and fourth decades in males so again there is a dichotomy in what the literature says and what theoretically the pathophysiologic mechanisms start to uh, profess in regarding these injuries obesity is an important component and patients with bmi more than 25 or 30 are definitely more predisposed uh, uh, more like 30 more than 30 are definitely predisposed to moral level lesions and the basic reason is that a fatter a human being the more the perforating vessel has to traverse uh, uh, per unit volume of tissue and the larger is the volume of subcutaneous fat and therefore uh, the quantum and the relative area of bleed and potential space is definitely higher so how do these lesions present they present mostly and di they are diagnosed mostly any time between 3 days to 2 weeks that's the average time uh, to diagnosis which the literature quotes missed diagnosis and diagnostic delays are very common up to 33 to 44% which means almost one third to uh, one one fourth of these patients will not be detected or detected late uh, the important things to register is that if you have a patient who has tire marks ecchymosis friction burns or contusions over the skin these are not to be taken lightly and these are to be observed investigated and uh, treated with optimally so as to not miss a very major uh, complicating injury along with the uh, bony damage that is present in a polytrauma patient and what is extremely important clinically to assess is that swelling and especially that associated with fluctuation is a very innocuous sign so if you have a swelling a relatively uh, innocuous looking lesion which has fluctuation you definitely need to do uh, the investigations and you definitely need to treat it appropriately depending upon the, the individual presentation in in case so the imaging modalities essentially x rays are done but those are essentially to find out the underlying bony injuries ultrasounds if available are non invasive rapid readily available inexpensive investigations but the problem with these are they are user dependent and the doppler studies went done for dvt in certain situations and if you have a good ultrasonologist these are investigations which can be done and which are helpful in delineating and differentiating between uh, uh, hematomas as well as lymph filled or blood and lymph filled uh, uh, cystic cavities ct scans essentially are for bony lesion they are not the uh, diagnostic events of choice however they may help in tissue characterization because of the uh, uh, different types of hounslow units that may be involved in ct scans but ct scans reserve their right to be diagnostic tools for bony lesions and the boss of diagnosis essentially is the mri and melado and bencardino essentially gave a uh, imaging classification in which they classified the mri based findings of a moral level lesion into six types 
and those basically based on whether it is a seroma as in type 1 or whether it is a blood and lymph field pseudocyst with fibrosis around leading to formation of a, a pseudo capsule where there is a possibility and high incidence of infection complicating the bony injury or the polytraumatized situation coming to what we all need to understand management if you have a large lesion where there is pain swelling and a deformity occurring at the at the local site of the lesion one has to assess whether the skin is viable or not and if the skin is viable one needs to aspirate especially if fluctuation is present uh, and see what is the quantum of fluid uh, aspirated and it is uh, well proven in the literature as if the quantum of fluid aspirated from these lesions is more than 50 ml there is a very high chance of recurrence to about 40 to 60% of these more and level lesions so dare not walk into early or pre planned or unpremedit uh, unmedit premeditated surgeries if you have a huge cystic uh, uh, swelling or, or a more and level lesion unless it is properly and appropriately dealt with so if there a fluid amount is less than 50 ml one can observe compress do an uh, uh, a limited percutaneous drainage or if the uh, volume of uh, blood and fluid aspirated is more than 50 ml then one has to go in surgically and especially if the skin is not viable then these patients need to be treated surgically so different scenario four different scenarios and we will talk about all of them with a case each so case one was a 21 year old male sustained injury in a road traffic accident had an iliac crest fracture a uh, fracture and had a moderate level lesion in the region of the lower flank and the proximal thigh those were the lesions the ultrasound revealed uh, septations and a uh, hit uh, a hypoechoic lesion in the uh, soft tissue plane of the body the ct scan revealed a bony injury which probably does not need uh, anything doing this patient for other reasons had to be conserved but he did exceptionally well with compression bandaging with a pelvic binder and after 2 years his soft tissue lesion had also healed and his bony injury had healed without any uh, significant intervention so this patient did but with the uh, uh, conservative treatment but that was essentially because the volume of the cystic cavity was not high another case a 27 year old female uh, in a road in a railway traffic accident sustained on open grade 3c uh, crush injury a right lower limb with traumatic amputation of the leg at the distal third level and had a moral level lesion that was the pictures of the lady with the uh, with the injury in the leg a, a hemodynamic atls assessment and evaluation was done for her she was uh, uh, assessed for any other hemodynamic compromises in other uh, organ systems and had a moral level lesion in the posterior part of the thigh which required debrima so a surgery was done for debridement along with a below knee amputation for a 3c injury the moral level lesion was debrided uh, percutaneously once and had to undergo repeat debridement after 7 days the stump had to be revised and finally she required a third debridement with uh, skin grafting for her stump and uh, the important thing with the debrima was that once the debridement was being done Uh, we required the help of uh, the vascular surgeons because the uh, the external iliac pedicle was exposed and it required uh, the plastic and uh, plastic reconstruction as well so the plastic surgeons did a grassless slab to cover the external iliac vessel and skin grafting for the lesion so the important thing here was that the debridement has to be aggressive it has to be extensive and as in this case the external iliac vessel was uh, exposed which cannot be covered by a flimsy tissue so it required a, a muscle flap uh, like a grassless based flap in this case and the other soft tissue component of the wound very often requires only a skin graft because the muscle and the blood supply to this region is so good so one has to be careful with what uh, there is but one can never be very restrictive about the quality of debridement that one needs to do in these lesions and this patient eventually uh did reasonably well unfortunately we uh, had re requested her to come and send pictures of her but those have not come another case this is uh, courtesy of a friend and colleague dr pradeep uh, a 56 year old female sustained injury in a road traffic accident reported on day 4 had a gluteal uh, a moral level lesion with a pelvic injury this just goes to show uh, demonstrate that 
these injuries not only need to be debrided, but they can change the course of how one will treat the bony injury. So this was a pelvic injured patient with a gluteal moral level lesion, which required an aggressive debridement with uh, exposure of the subcutaneous tissues and the soft tissues underlying, and which essentially led to a delay in, uh, in treatment of the pelvic injury. So one did, uh, one has to do minimally invasive fixations, uh, which to bypass and sustain the uh, stability of the pelvic ring while allowing the moral level lesions to heal. So that is a very important thing that one has to understand that moral level lesions very often will change the way we look at and treat these injuries. And therefore one has to master the minimally invasive techniques as well, because certain situations, soft tissue conditions will prevent us from doing our standard operative procedures that we would like to do in certain pelvic and establer fracture patients. Sclerosis and therapy, I have no experience with this and it is only for completion sake, but these lesions, uh, this therapy is done, uh, especially uh, only in chronic lesions where the lesion has been missed, delayed in diagnosis or presenting late with a pseudocyst with a, a fibrosis and a capsule that has already formed. And what was, uh, in, what was uh, uh, important to register is that these were lesions which were very similar to uh, the uh, pleural effusions which one uh, saw in tubercular patients in uh, pulmonology. And therefore, uh, the technique used uh, to treat these were what was used in the pulmonology patients, and those were to give them doxycycline, talcum, and absolute alcohol. These are the three sclerosants which are used. Each has a slight variation in the mechanism by which they act, and the basic way they act is that they destroy the mesothelial cell lining of the pseudocyst, induce fibrosis, and seal the pseudocyst and help uh, healing and fibrosis and obliteration of the cyst. The overall recurrence rates for the uh, doc for this particular sclerosin therapy is 95.7%, uh, but these therapies are useful only in chronic lesions and not in acute scenarios where uh, debridement and taking care, aggressive, uh, aggressive debridement and taking care of the wound is very important so as to allow uh, the treating team to take care of the bone injuries. So to summarize, moral level lesions are closed internal degloving injuries, which have to be suspected, especially if there is swing and fluxion present in the wound clinically. They are a result of high energy trauma, which present acutely between three days to two weeks, but also as chronic lesions as a fair percentage, almost 30 to 40% of them will be missed. Extent of internal degloving is far more than what uh, than the extent of the external appearance of the injury. Contusions, friction burns, abrasions, they should create a suspicion in the mind of the clinician as to what is happening inside and should uh, stimulate the performance of the appropriate investigations. The MRI is the big boss of uh, diagnostic uh, gold standard in cases with moral level lesion. Soft tissue degloving will definitely take priority over the surgical triage. And even as part of the surgical triage, the damage control will continue as well as the soft tissue management. And the definitive fixation paradigm has to change from early total care or early appropriate care to damage control orthopedics. So external fixations will take priority over delayed definitive fixations. And the management of the model level will basically depend upon the extent of the lesion, the time of presentation, and the clinical condition of the patient. So the management options essentially looks at skin viability. Aspirations are extremely important to do in these patients. Conservative, conservative management is an option uh, in certain patients where the volume of the aspirate is not much, but the rates of reference, recurrence can be higher. Percutaneous aspiration, if more than 50 ml, leads to almost a 50% chance of recurrence. The go-to for moral level lesions are debridement, aggressive debridements, which will require a coverage, a plastic surgery coverage, based on the, the area where the moral level lesion is present, like a proximal thigh may need a, a skin graft or a flap. The flaps that can be done are the VY plasties, the local flaps, the free flaps, or the certain uh, uh, tailor-made flaps for specific regions of uh, 
uh, the wound uh, depending upon what part is exposed minimally invasive and uh, delayed management of skeletal injuries is very important to understand and master and that will eventually form the key and the basis for success in treating these patients well and uh, putting them back into uh, successful rehabilitation thank you for your time thank you dr abhay so that bring us to the end of this uh, very exhaustive but very detailed uh, discussion on pelvic fractures uh, we have had one question where uh, somebody had asked that if there is a adequate posterior stabilization can we just put the patient on a pelvic binder or on a uh, external fixator and i have already replied on the chat that uh, yes external fixator or plating or infix is a better option as compared to a uh, simple pelvic binder uh, in terms of definitive fixation apart from that we have had no unanswered questions so this uh, brings me to the end of the session i wish to thank the entire ioa committee including the president secretary the ioa uh, scientific committee ioa sub speciality committee and i wish to thank all our delegates who have attended today's session all along i was watching it also on the ortho tv or ioa tv and we had close to 55 to 75 uh, people watching it all along and uh, it was a great task uh, done by all the learned faculty so i wish to thank all the faculty on behalf of aopas i think uh, this brings us to the end if there is anyone who wants to uh, give any uh, feedback or comment they are welcome or otherwise we can just close the session maybe we can ask dr sain to say something about this yeah uh, thank you what we must appreciate is that in the days to come the awareness about the pelvic especially the initial management is very very important as highlighted right from the first talk that the initial care is important to salvage the patient here it is a question of losing the patient saving the patient and probably the best thing is as was discussed that we must have a protocol settled in each hospital at its own design which can help in salvage of the patient that's the most important thing and once that acute thing is settled down then there are definitely ways there are definitely um, uh, kind of a patterns which can be managed with the proper uh, subsequent knowledge and proper skills uh, and there are likely to be good outcomes if we are able to take care of that thing so most important thing is to perceive that this is an injury which affects the mortality this is an injury which has to be tackled in very first few hours with maximum care and if we are able to have that attention given to this injury probably we can have a better outcome as far as mortality is concerned and subsequently obviously it is a surgery which needs to be done as has been explained in multiple lectures it has to be done with care understanding its classification understanding the various reduction modalities the fixation modalities and looking at the way the complications need to be avoided so thank you thank you sir thank you dr rakesh uh can we all call it a day yes yeah yes. pranav i think so, so. Much. thank you thank pranav you. for a wonderful thank job thank you thank you thank you all thank you uh, raju raju you just stay i need to ask you something the uh, recording will be available on uh, ioa tv as well as on aopas uh, channel on youtube so for people who want to again go through it they have this option and uh, uh, now i hand over to dr rakesh rajput thank you sir no no i think uh, officially we can close now uh, there are people okay. who have to go uh, okay. it's just like what in up things we can discuss uh, i want to ask you something lumbar pelvic fixation so and i want to go i mean they have to go at prolonging these discussions so raju i was just listening to one um, spine this uh, and he presented uh, this they have a different way of fixing it what they do is uh, they fix the lateral part of sacrum and from there they go all the way from sacral leg joint all the way the direction is almost the same coming down just superostabular area but they start just lateral uh, you know to the uh, the lateral part of sacrum and uh, they go straight so they don't have to uh, what their advantage they are saying is they don't have to use the connecting rod which is a weak link in this fixation so any thoughts thoughts about that one yeah i have see uh, i'm not a 
spine surgeon. I don't do spine, but I take the help of my spine surgeons. But uh, 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 in terms of that, we have tried uh, doing that uh, screw from the S2 level uh, of the sacrum to go directly into the ilium. But in a fractured fragment where there is a sacral fracture, which is uh, grossly comminuted in that area, I think getting an entry point at that point is very, very difficult. That is what I have observed. The lateral, the part is uh, broken. That is what I felt. No, I mean, I, and they have put no SI joint screws. So I actually had a big argument with him that this is very inadequate and uh, almost like a Mickey Mouse fixation. So, but they were saying that they are quite happy with it. No, I mean, that would be okay for a very fresh fracture. Very fresh or very simple, straightforward. But just about, are, yeah. If you are looking at something delayed where your reduction forces are likely to be high, then this fixation is likely to fail. We have to go to standard as Raju has told it out. We need to go to that very corridor of uh, LC2 where we will have a best fixation in the ilium to stabilize that uh, spinal fibula extension. Uh, the fact, if I can ask, I enter there, Dr. Rajput. Hi, Vivek. You are always welcome. Yes. So, the fact is that they try to do the spine people take it from between the S1, S2 lateral to the neural foramina because they feel that the, as you said, that you don't require a connector. You can have it in straight line. The second thing is many of the people, they do it in a percutaneous fashion for such cases and it's a percutaneous spinal pelvic that they're doing. The third thing is that they feel that if you do it from a PSIS, the prominence of the sacral of the tulip is going to give you create problems until unless you dissect out the PSIS, do an osteotomy and then go about. So the fixation going from the sacrum into the ileum is a good fixation. But as Raju has said, many most of the time when we are fixing it, that area is comminuted. And that area entry point is just going from the medial cortex of the ileum rather than through the sacrum, then through the joint and then through the ileum. So it helps you to make sure that your tulip is right at the base of the sacrum. That helps. Otherwise, it is not of much help. I have done both sort of fixations with my spine fellows and my juniors who do now spine. They asked me to do that way, but we have found that there's not much difference, but they say that the stability might be better. As regards the iliosacral screw fixation, as Dr. Sain has said, if you are doing it in delayed cases, just the distraction which you get with the spine to the sacrum, it leads to a mediolateral flaring up. And that flaring up, it does not bring the pelvis vertically down. It flares it up mediolaterally and causes distraction. And there the iliosacral screw is a must until unless you fix that your mediolateral opening of the sacrum and the SI joint will happen. And that's why we do a triangular osteosynthesis along with the spinal pelvic diagiosacrum. Yes. And if you are doing spinal pelvic purely to stabilize it in an undisplaced position, when it is Isler's grade medial to the facet of the L5, then yes, you can get away without putting an iliosacral screw. But when you are doing it for distraction, the mediolateral tripe, that plane deformity can be corrected only through an iliosacral and not through lumbar pelvic. And uh, there is another thing, it has to be both sides and yes. both sides need to be cross-linked. And if you are able to have that cross-linking, then the frame stays. If it is on one side, obviously, this will need to work. Yes. I was going to make just exactly that point, that once the iliac screw has been placed and the lumbosacral rod has been before, you can do a distraction to do a reduction of maybe a 2 or a type 3 Roy Camille where there is either anterior or posterior translation, but the stability mediolaterally, what Vivek is saying, with just the lumbosacral fixation alone will stay only when you do a, a, dis, a mediolateral destruction of the iliac screws and then do a tensioning of the rods. Otherwise, it will cause an anterior opening of the SI joint. Yeah. Pradeep, you are still around? I think yes, yes, sir. I am there, sir. Uh, haircut good. <laughs> Nahi, sir, wo, hey, my father lost, passed away three months. Oh, lost, sorry, so, sorry to hear that. Uh, that. That is what he had. Oh, I didn't know that. So sorry, so, uh, Pradeep, a question no. tha regarding this uh, plating Asin. of SI joints. Uh, current Asin. day and age, mein, what are the indications for posterior SI joint platings? Sir, uh, I don't find any indication 
as of now by which i am compelled uh, but i think so uh, means post if yes, i joined right you are or trans iliac well that's how we started off our careers that's how we started are you off saying actually saying trans iliac or are you saying trans iliac uh, or sacro anterior yeah. si where well, si joint plating uh, whichever method you want to use anterior the trans iliac i mean trans iliac from posteriorly yeah. as a supplementation so for bilateral cases do you think it's sacral. sometimes uh, easier to just do the uh, whether rod or plate whichever from posterior or uh, again though you want to do uh, screws from both sides the screw has to be there sometimes instead of lumbopelvic uh, a way of protecting that can be a trans sacral plate that can be one but that is still not the um standard what is been discussed so uh, otherwise whenever screws are enough screws are enough and when screws are not enough we have to put lumbopelvic fixation but sometimes we say that if we the sacral fracture especially the vertical shear we are fixing with only screws and uh, you want to protect that then extra additional uh, trans sacral plate can be added i mean that's a very important point because if there is a comminution in the sacral fracture when you are putting a, a non compressed side lock fully threaded screw the stability achieved at that level biomechanically have not been found to be better than the trans iliac plating so in all those cases where you are not able to have a bone to bone continuity and stability to that level trans iliac plating is still a safer thing and biomechanically it has been found is a stronger than the screw fixations in those cases it is good I biomechanically know. when you have got a good interference fit of the sacrum but whenever there is a combination and especially the two sides it's better to have a plating as an additional thing or as an exclusive thing if you are not able to put a plating a screw even so now that we have come to this point just tell me what plate you use and how do you mold it there are two things first we initially had those standard recon plates and what we do is we do not, we with the osteotome do a rail loading kind of a thing but we used to learn about it that there are two patterns now in the superior part i make a notch uh, there are the incision once the incision in which there is a lesion you go medial to the iliac uh, posterior iliac spine and on the side where you have to cross you will do later to it so that a 7 cm difference will stay now on the iliac crest you will create a notch for the size of the plate so that your plate does not become come upper than the notch and it stays over the iliac border and through that iliac border you take a spy uh, this thing osteotome and cut or break that spinous process and do the same thing on the other side also and then you pass a spinous uh, this the osteotome to cross both sides and uh, after that you put a plate which on one side is you can already bend prevent and one side is straight and then you pass it by rail loading to the other side and once it has reached to the other side you fix on the uh, bent side first and thereafter you will manipulate that plate to bend it to that end degree that is what you do in the upper part down there also but there the prominence is too much so you cannot go the same way in the lower part of it there you make a u kind of appearance you go from lower down to the upper level on one side of it and thereafter you shift that way you twist a 90 degree 90 degree on one side and 90 degree 90 degree on the other side and make a u kind of appearance so first is a kind of a u going anterior posteriorly and second is a u going inferior superiorly so that way you get multi planar stability of that uh, fixation so niche wale plate kaun se use karte hain sir jo bhi but then you are twisting it to yeah you are twisting this way also and this way also yeah. so you you go this way i do the deputynthes plate i do it all the time so we are actually now doing a, a 35 patient follow up of 2 years of tension band plates and uh, our results with single plate the deputynthes plate as well as an anterior ring fixation and we're very happy with what results we are getting so probably in another month's time that paper will be ready okay it's a very beautiful thing to do i do it all the time very simple and very very good to do and i close the uh, i do and i do an osteotomy sir jaise aap bata rahe ho once i do that osteotomy i take off that graft i do it with a saw uh, and once i do that osteotomy i put in a plate i stabilize the uh, the cortical window of the uh, uh, the bone fragment that i have taken up to seat the plate and i put it on top of the plate and, and anchor it with wires and close it with 
with the uh, periosteum and then take the wire off so that uh, i have bony healing uh, bone link above the plate with the uh, remaining cortical area that gives additional stability we have not had anything cutting up two bone infections healed with medication and treatment and uh, probably once that paper comes uh, once that literature and follow up is done we'll be able to say what works in our case. so abhay tera incision uh, two vertical incisions and one central incision as no 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 i my incision is a one and a half inch long incision just on the sides uh, over the psis on yeah. on the two sides and i tunnel everything from there and it's it's a beautiful incision it does everything for us can read the paper on jot in 2009 2010 by renate land dorfer from austria innsbruck she has explained this transilia plating in a very nice manner just the way abhay is describing taking out a window up from the bone pushing it back and then they i normally put in a screw from there which holds my psis contour contour is properly maintained and your screw is going through that psis screw into the plate hole and then into the ileum as well so that gives you more yeah. compacting that's the thing so landorfer so, plate is a very nice way of fixing this yes that's what so what i do in every case is that i use the uh, i use the starting point of the posterior starting point of the lc2 corridor and i uh, direct my long 60 mm screw towards the iliac crest there is adequate space there and it's a fantastic fixation which keeps the plate there and on top of that there is a dhakan of the exactly. uh, osteotomized fragment that i have killed it does beautifully well and we do we have stopped using two plates now uh, if the patient can afford it i do a synthes plate it's a fantastically stable plate and patients uh, we've not had a problem we've not no cut out till now no infection no cut out what about the prominence over the uh, sacral spine sir hota hi nahi hai होता ही नहीं है जो पी एस आई एस है उनके लेवल पे एक विच इज अबाउट फाइव टू सेवन मिलीमीटर्स डीप एंड विच इज ब्रॉड इनफ टू सीट द प्लेट वेरी कंफर्टेबली एंड ऑन टॉप ऑफ दैट आई पुट बैक द बोन देर अगेन सो द प्लेट इज इज सिटिंग इन साइड एंड दिस एंड देर इज नो प्रॉमिस सो आई थिंक प्रणव इज गॉन बट आई थॉट ही विल टॉक अबाउट द नेक्स्ट वेबिनार what should be should be concentrate on rest problem sir i think we are still live i think we are still live no we can we can stop that uh, just hold uh, on you are only at the host oh how do i stop this you click on that uh, live custom streaming service yeah i did stop and then there is option of stop or there would be a